Good morning uh, and welcome to the 19th meeting uh, in 2015 of the Health Sport Committee. Um, I would ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones as they can often interfere with our sound system, but you will also notice that um, uh, some of us are using tablet devices uh, instead of a hard copy of the papers. Uh, our first item on the agenda today is a, an evidence session um, uh, with directors of finance on, uh, from five NHS boards as part of the committee's NHS boards budget scrutiny. Um, and we have with us this morning uh, Mark White, um, director of finance, NHS uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Uh, Derek Lindsay, uh, Director of Finance, NHS Ayrshire and Arden, and Lindsay Bedford, yes. um, uh, Interim Director of Finance, NHS Tayside, Katie Lewis, Director of Finance, NHS Dumfries and Galloway, and Marion Fordham, Director of Finance, NHS Western Isles. Welcome to you all. We appreciate your attendance uh, this morning. Um, we we, we, had, we delayed you, a, 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 you know, a bit this morning we were in a pre-brief and we were struggling um, uh, with uh, our papers over the weekend because there seems to be such um, a, a, a lot of uh, performance targets and data. It was almost, you know, I don't, you know, we were struggling with it. You, do it in a, you, you deal with this on a daily basis. And we were struggling to... Uh, in our uh, brief discussion this morning, to, uh, to, to have some, you may be able to help us with this, to have some evaluation about how useful this data is, how it drives improvement, what, what's useful, what's less useful. Um, uh, but for us, uh, and dealing with our papers and the papers we had and the questionnaires coming back, there seems to be a lot of data collection. There seems to be a lot of performance targets. Some of it is important uh, because it drives the way you act. Not, it would seem, always in the interest of a business plan because it can drive you in directions that take you away from your business plan, it would seem. So the, after that round robin there, <laughs> the question is, um, performance targets, how important are they? What ones are important? What drives your performance? What drives improvement? Uh, and is the data that we collect useful to yourselves? And is it useful to the general public and politicians like ourselves trying to uh, establish what's going on in the service? Anyone want to take those uh, 15 questions? Uh, then I would appreciate it. Derek, you look, you, 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 you blinked first. OK. Um, yes, there are a number of uh, performance targets, although uh, the, the main ones which boards are measured against, uh, and indeed our local delivery plan is based on, used to be called heat targets, um, and there's a limited number of those. It does drive to some extent at least the, the investment that's required. So, for example, uh, the treatment time guarantee, which was introduced a couple of years ago, um, in Ayrshire and Arran, we invested uh, about £1.8 million additionally in that because uh, that in orthopaedics, which was the main area where um, we had patients who were breaching the treatment time guarantee. So it does uh, drive performance uh, in some areas. For example, more recently around the accident and emergency and the four-hour target there, uh, again, there has been significant investment. There is increasing demand, and we've had to invest to manage uh, that. So, I would say performance does have a uh, performance targets do have a direct relationship with some of the areas of investment for boards. Anyone else? Yeah, I think to, to add to Derek's comments, I think in, in answering to answer your, your sort of main question, Kim, is are these performance targets useful? I think absolutely they are. Um, uh, you did touch on the fact that there is a, a huge range of them, so invariably some of them uh, are, will be more important than others, and we do base our investment decisions as a business and, and in terms of our day-to-day -day operations on the ones that are deemed to be more important. And as Derek touched on over the past you know, several years, that has tended to be the TTG waiting times, the e waiting times, delayed discharge, all these kind of targets. So to answer the question, yes, they are useful. Uh, I think they're useful to the public and I think they're useful to us in terms of making 
making our uh, investment decisions and, and in terms of the day-to-day -day running of, 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 the, of the operations. Not necessarily to you, Mark, but do they dictate your investment decisions in a reactive way or in a planned way? I think that's what we're trying to get at. You, you know, the, you know, we're part of this problem that, about E and E, and you know, if you miss a target, you know, there's all of that pressure, and public pressure, and politicians jump up and down, and whatever, whatever. But probably the politicians know that if we reduce the demand going in the hospital and speeded stuff coming out of the hospital, I'm talking about community investment here, it would reduce some of that demand on you. So is it reactive or is it, uh, uh, does, it, uh, does it necessarily meet our business plans over a, a longer period of time to continue in this way? Maybe if I could yes, just say certainly, in, in certainly, relation I'm, to... I'm happy the others will come in and I'll give them an opportunity. Most of the targets do tend to be focused on acute services and, and uh, therefore... You know that shifting the balance of care um, may um, may not be the, the major focus around those, those types of targets that I've mentioned. Um, I think there is something about how tight the targets are and the flexibility within them, because you do have a law of diminishing returns, and in order to get to 100 per cent of something, you have to invest a disproportionate amount. So an example I would use um, relate to waiting list initiatives. So our normal capacity and our, our workforce, etc., is able to deliver and, and hopefully is staffed up to a level where we would normally expect to, to be able to deliver the targets. However, if we have unusual levels of staff sickness or uh, operational difficulties, we then have to invest a disproportionate amount to catch up again through things like waiting list initiatives. And therefore, having flexibility around some of the targets, either uh, you don't need to meet them all the time or it's maybe only 90 per cent target level that you're aiming for rather than 100 per cent means that you're not having to invest at a premium rate to, yeah. to catch up on yeah. some. Can I have any... Uh, Marion and then Katie? Certainly. I, I just wanted to say, I think really that uh, when you're considering the benefits of doing something new or differently, then it has added impetus if there's a benefit in terms of achieving one of the national or heat targets. So it can actually... Uh, lend weight to the argument for doing something, but it's not necessarily the only driver. Um, and the other thing from, from the Western Isles' point of view is, of course, with the targets, we're often um, affected because we're dealing with such low numbers that it, it doesn't take very many uh, you know, differences to actually make a big percentage difference, and then we look like an outlier when really it's maybe one or two patients. Yes, I see that point made in the papers. Katie? Mm -hmm. I suppose I just wanted to reflect on the Dumfries and Galloway position and whilst it affects some of our investment decisions, particularly I think Derek reflected on the TTG and also around our unscheduled care pathways within an emergency division, I think one of the things we've been endeavouring to do is to get a balanced acute systems to ensure that our demand and capacity are, are managed so that what you don't see are the, the sort of peaks and troughs in, in demand within the system and some of our investments that we've made are, are looking to get that level of sustainability into the system and I think that's certainly what the ambition of, of acute systems should be is to, is to get that that balance both in terms of managing demand somewhat downwards in, in some instances, but also ensuring that we've got the capacity um, to do that. Lindsay? Yeah, I would just probably just add to, to, Derek, to Derek's comments. Um, uh, I think it is about that flexibility, uh, about achieving uh, the targets 100% of the time. I think we all recognise the pressures that we all boards face uh, over the, the winter period. And that certainly puts additional pressures on delivering and, and sustaining the, the treatment time guarantees over that period. Anyone else? Can I, can I ask one question of what you all know, because uh, you know, I think it is a, an area that the committee is interested in, in terms of, I think you mentioned that uh, disproportional investment to, you know, so what, do, what, does it, what does it cost the board, you know, to, uh, to, to get from the 90% to the 95%, the 95% to the 100%, you know, you, you mentioned disproportional costs there to get to these figures. You know, what is, what is the difference, I sometimes ask myself, uh, in cost uh, uh, from somebody getting that uh, elective uh, procedure done on a Friday rather than the following Monday? 
you know, uh, I think the, com the committee would like to have some idea about the impact and cost of that. Uh, uh, you, you know, that, w that we don't always hear about when we talk about uh, 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 targets. And as, a, as a general uh, thing for waiting list initiatives, consultants are paid about three times the normal rate to, to uh, do a waiting list initiative. So if you have a consultant working the normal working pattern and then ask them to come in and do a, a waiting list initiative, it can be about three times the rate. Clearly, private sector and using the private sector to increase our capacity is also more expensive than having our, our own mm -hmm. in-house um, provision. Uh, I, so I, I don't have figures to say how much would it cost to be 90% or 95% oh. or 100%. But as a general rule, that's the kind of scale of difference in, in salary costs. But as financial directors, you must know what it costs you and your board to mm -hmm. meet those yeah. demands. With, within Ayrshire and Arran, uh, over the last few years, we've spent about £3 million per annum on waiting list initiatives. Mm -hmm. Now, some of that wouldn't necessarily... Uh, uh, be sp specifically for things like orthopaedics. It could be about radiology capacity because we uh -huh. have vacancies uh -huh. and so forth. But roughly £3 million a year we are spending mm. on waiting list initiatives. Anyone else? Mark? Yeah, well, just to, add to, to Derek's comment, I think we've been very focused on, the, on our AVE waiting times. Um, and to give you an example, again, it's very difficult to, to give you an answer, direct answer to how much does it cost to move uh, the percentages. But, you know, for, as an example, we spent an extra £5 million pounds over the winter to try and you know, give ourselves that, that breathing space to try and meet the target. It's not always a case of, of, of being able to split the cost down because it, it can have an impact. I mean, to achieve your any waiting times, you've got to have support beds, you've got to have the staff, you've got to have a whole range of things in uh -huh. place. So it, it is very, very complex and very complicated to be able to work out exactly how much it does cost to meet the targets. It's, it's, it's a far wider picture. But as I say, you can break it down into particular initiatives, as, as Derek said and as I said, so you can put sums on particular drives or particular areas of it. And, and for Glasgow, that was an extra £5 million pounds just, just to get us through the winter. Right. Anyone else? Marianne? Um, just to say, I mean, the incremental costs for us, if, if, we are, if we look like we're going to breach the TTG, for instance, can be enormous because we might end up having to send patients away to uh, another board where we don't have a contract, you know, so that we end up paying uh -huh. quite, quite a lot for that. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I suppose it comes back to my original question. You know, if you, do, if you don't understand what it's actually, you know, that detailed cost now, it, 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 it makes it difficult for you to make the argument that we, that, that we get that flexibility that would allow you certain savings that may be invested in other areas in the community that would result in preventive, you know, for, 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 for next winter, that if some of that money was re-diverted to reduce the demand... So you didn't have to pay. Would you repeat the figure that you said, Mark, was it? Yeah, it was £5 million, pounds just particularly for a winter last year. Uh -huh. uh, and I've planned for a similar amount the, the, this winter. Right, so, just additional uh, on top of... That's on top of the, my day-to-day, -day and, and, you know, uh -huh. spend. So, uh -huh. um, but as I say, that's predominantly in Glasgow. That's focusing on our E&E waiting times. And it is very challenging. It's a demand-led service. You, you know, very much you can, you, it's hard to predict you know, what, what your, your, your attendance, the pattern of attendance is going to be. So um, for us in Glasgow, the TTG waiting times has been uh, more successful. We've, we've, we've been successful achieving them. It's our and we waiting times, and that's where, as I say, it'd be very difficult to put a, a, a range of spend on them. You can, you can allocate some money to it, and, uh, and that should hopefully have an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got Mike McKenzie, followed by Richard Simpson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, um, what strikes me um, in looking at this overall area is, both in terms of the targets and some of the health outcomes, um, with some exceptions, there seems to me to be a remarkable convergence of the data, so much so that some of our papers, in terms of the graphs we're looking at and so on, they've had to expand the scale to amplify the differences. And, and that seems to me to be remarkable. And I wonder if, um, in deciding uh, you know, uh, allocations within your budgets, um, if finance directors don't say, actually, we are doing really well in this particular area against the Scottish average. Therefore, we can reduce expenditure a bit 
and put it into another area where we're not doing so well, and that that over, over a long period is what's driven this convergence, the remarkable convergence, despite the fact that in some areas, Western Isles, we know huge incidents of fuel poverty and we know about the health you know, effects of that. Um, and what I wonder, though, is, and this is you know, just a general question, is that effect, if that's the effect that there is, is that not driving um, us in a kind of race to the bottom, to the lowest common denominator, rather than a race to the top, so that, you know, um, uh, health boards that do particularly well in, in certain areas set a standard that the others strive to get towards? So is the, the average a kind of lowest common denominator? Are they comparable across the health boards? I mean, this, this data, and if they're not, why not? Could, could I maybe start off by saying, I mean, we all have the same target, so I guess that's the first thing that would drive us all towards being similar in, in terms of those. And where we are not meeting those targets, the performance management aspect from the Scottish Government would be coming in to say, you know, why, why aren't you getting your performance up to that? We can have support teams that come in to do that. And there is a, a sharing of best practice um, so that if one board is uh, able to uh, deliver good performance in an area through innovation, then we would try and share that. So we would hope that the, the drive is uh, towards best practice and learning rather than a drive, you know, a race for the bottom. I was just reflecting on the DNG position. I mean, we've, over the last year or so, had quite strong performance around our emergency department and our A&E weights. Um, we've certainly been above the, the sort of the 95%. And I think one of those things around that is about ensuring that we've got a sustainable system. You know, we've, we have brought down our emergency department weights. And I think what, what we're trying to do is get a system where, you know, it's not just fixed for today, it's fixed for the future. And, and I think... The achievement and the movement up to the 98 is going to be is going to be really challenging. But I think it's right that you know we sort of set a standard and that that we all aspire to that because that's um, you know we can't set the standard too low because that's um, in conjunction with clinical teams with patients and and the like because we wouldn't want to move back from that standard in terms of the the four hour waits for for patients within our system. Thank you, Lindsay. So. In terms of Tayside, Tayside uh, certainly has been a front runner in terms of uh, accident emergency waiting times. It's probably regularly uh, attained the 98% uh, level, not the, the, the 95% uh, over the years. And uh, certainly we've had a, a significant number of visiting boards over the years uh, looking at the model uh, that, that we have in Tayside. Clearly, we did uh, invest uh, two or three uh, years ago in, in, in accident emergency. Uh, for Tayside, uh, we, we certainly have challenges around the treatment time guarantees, and I guess we, as ever, we look to uh, all other boards to, to see what, what they are doing uh, to see if we can improve our performance. Right. I mean, I, mean, I, I perhaps didn't um, articulate that question as well as I might have, but, um, and I'm not just solely talking about targets, I'm also talking about outcomes, because the committee inquiry and the you know, the questions that you've responded to in your written evidence touches on outcomes as well as targets. And um, what I struggle to uh, come to terms with is that um, each of you are dealing with different social demographics, different social economics, and um, matters that are often largely out with your control, driving health problems that are different by their nature in each area. And yet there's a remarkable convergence of um, when we look at outcomes and target achievements. And I just wondered how you felt um, this general approach. Is it, contri is it um, contriving to create a situation where the, the good becomes the enemy of the best? Please mention as, as one of the three that uh, you've picked is about emergency admissions, and uh, at that that's uh, noted in the reports. And there is a graph, which actually you can see a trend that the west of Scotland boards have higher levels of emergency admissions per 
10,000 or 100,000 population than other boards in Scotland. Um, so I think there is a factor in there about socioeconomics, about deprivation, about um, just patterns of presentation at, um, at A&E departments and so forth. There will also be something, however, also about the model in which how we deal with um, uh, patients and, and, as Lindsay mentioned, in relation to Tayside, their GP assessment model is certainly being uh, followed and copied by a number of uh, boards, including my own. So there is something, there is a factor about socio-economic, but there is also how, how we can respond to that demand. So that would then take me neatly on, and my last question, convener, with your indulgence, is that um, it, it takes me neatly into that direction so that um, the kind of wider approach towards these health problems indicated by the you know, integrated joint boards. Um, how far, and, and I noticed that there have been you know, a huge range of percentage different contributions from various health boards into these integrated joint boards. On what basis do you make the calculation of what proportion of your budgets that you put into the integrated joint boards? Because there the really is a big, big spread in the range of contributions from, from uh, health boards. Yes, Mary. Say, I know that we're uh, quite different to some of the other boards in terms of the approach that we've taken. And uh, my health board decided it wished to put the minimum it could into the integrated joint board. Um, what I can say, though, is that the figures that you had in the response have now changed because following uh, feedback from the submission of the integration scheme, we've now included some further services. So actually now our percentage contribution is very comparable with some of the bigger boards, though not as much as places like Dumfries. And on what basis did you make the initial decision and on what basis did you change your mind? I think, I think there's an apprehension about losing control over some of the acute services that we manage. Kate, I'll, I'll get some other responses, Mike. Anyone else in terms of the... Yeah, Shall Katie? I, uh, in terms of the specifics of the Dumfries and Galloway position, I mean, we've got the int both the entirety of acute services and a range of other clinical services um, included within the, the integration joint board. In fact, everything that currently sits under our chief operating officer within health, um, who is also the chief officer designate for integration. And I think one of the, the reasons behind that is that we're co-terminus with our local authority, so that allows us to do that. That's something that not all boards are able to do because of the way that partnerships are created. And I think one of the things that we were keen to do to maximise the integration across the, the whole of the, the patient pathway and to not break down um, acute into sort of unscheduled care and the like. So um, we were concerned really that we would get the best benefits out of integration by having that full integration. But as, as Marion says, that that's maybe it's a bolder decision than, than other board areas have chosen. And we took that decision in discussion both within the health board and within the local partnership about what we thought was the right thing to do. Um, remembering, I suppose, the focus around integration is is improving the um, the services to patients at the you know on the on the ground. Derek, thank you. Yeah, um, and, and I guess for both Tayside and Ayrshire and Arran, we have three um, health and social care partnerships within our area, and Glasgow has I think five or six. So. Um, there is something for us about the synergy of acute services that it wouldn't be appropriate to split in three ways um, uh, the whole of acute services. There's synergies around the way in which they are delivered. In fact, we have two district general hospitals within our three, health, uh, our three council areas. Um, so I, I, it's perfectly understandable for Dumfries and Galloway to look at that in totality, whereas because of the, the uh, local authority boundaries and some other boards, it, it's more difficult to um, uh, look at splitting that up. Um, so, uh, from an Ayrshire and Arran perspective, we have uh, devolved the whole of mental health services, uh, all of primary care, all of our community hospitals to those uh, integration joint boards, uh, but the main district general hospitals are, are retained uh, within the, the board, uh, with the exception of some of the emergency services. 
which are uh, in the, what they call the set-aside budget, which are subject to the strategic plans that are prepared by those integration joint boards. And those would allow some movement of money between hospital and community there. Lindsay? So, so Tessie follows a, a, a similar position to, to Isha and Anne. I think it probably reflects out in the, in, in the report that, that, that you got that uh, Isha and Arne, uh, the percentage is 52% uh, of the overall budget and uh, Tayside's 54%. So, so as Derek says, uh, in, in, in Tayside we have three uh, local authorities and uh, shadow integrated joint boards that, that we're dealing with. And for the exact same reasons as, uh, as Derek's highlighted, um, at this stage, given the complexities of acute services within both the uh, Dunning and Wells and, and Perth Royal sites in, in, uh, in particular, then we focused on uh, delegating down the, the older people and, and adults' budgets that sit within our, our current uh, community health partnerships, uh, and, uh, which also brings in uh, mental health uh, as well as the community hospitals as well. Mark? Yeah. In answer to the initial question, and it's interesting because we're still finalising our budget, so I've been looking at these percentage splits as well to find out where Glasgow sits on. I mean, I think, in direct answer to the question, I think it's very much to do with the, the mix and the range of services that every board is, de is delegating to the IGB, and that does vary across each board. Um, that's just when it's in primary care uh, situation as well. I think the complexity or, or the, the larger part of complexity comes in, in your acute services because that is the challenging part to determine the range and the boundaries that, and the spectrum of services to which each board is allocating. So it's difficult to compare like with like. There is common themes, but it, it's a difficult situation. And uh, as accentuated in Glasgow, we're trying to, trying to get to a model of six of these. So uh, I understand the question, and, and, and I think that's the, the, the broad answer to, to why it's so different. I suppose, I suppose the other question that we discussed earlier is that we're, you're, you're understandably cautious approach because you've got to deliver all these acute services and worrying about all of that. But we have, we have a, a policy that is, is you know, generally, I think, accepted by this committee. We've got a 2020 vision that more people will be treated at home or closer to home or within the community. Now, is that cautious approach that you're demonstrating here consistent with a plan that's going to see more and more people delivered, delivered their health care in community settings rather than acute hospital settings? How do we, how do we, what, what type of planning is in place to, to get us there in that five years or, or beyond? Or is it just year to year you're doing this? Or? Yeah, there is uh, strategic plans that are being prepared by each of the three uh, integration joint boards within Ayrshire and Arran um, in consultation with uh, the, the health board. And they don't just focus on community services, they also look at uh, the emergency and elderly services delivered within the uh, acute hospitals. And the, the opportunity then for that integration joint board to propose a shift in the balance of resources. Uh, we have the three chief officers from the, the, uh, the health and social care partnership sitting around our corporate management team uh, as well. So they, they have a significant input to discussions that, that we have. Um, so they would reflect on, however, the increasing demands that are going into our acute uh, hospitals because of demographics. Um, and uh, whilst uh, perhaps initially the thinking was, well, well, we'll be able to take money out of acute services and transfer it to community services, um, the, first of all, we have to prevent people uh, going into those acute services because it is demand-driven at the moment. So there is a balance to, uh, that has to be struck about investment in community and in the increasing demand in acute. Anyone else? I think it's a very timely question. As Derek mentioned, the strategic plans for each of the IGBs and we drafted just now. And in answer to your question, yes, they very much are focusing on the themes of 2020, which is you know, early intervention, treating people at home um, or in the right community setting. So, so that is very much uh, exercising the, that process at the moment. Um, as Derek says, a complex situation in terms of moving funds from 
acute and, and you know elective and emergency surgeries in, into uh, preventative, uh, uh, more preventative methods. But that, that is very much the purpose of IGBs and very much where the focus is at the moment. I think the challenge will come in, in how we measure the outcomes from, from the IGBs, and that is again is something that's very much in train at the moment to, to get that suite of performance indicators that in however many years' time we can look back and, and determine that that, that flow and, and, and the, 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 the allocation of resources around that is working. Lindsay? I, I think, uh, if, if I reflect on the, the kind of forerunner uh, through the, the integrated resource framework, uh, and I guess that, that, that was part of the, the way of, of developing the data sets that would uh, at least to allow local communities uh, and, and local areas to understand the resources that they were consuming. Uh, and I think, um, but although integrated resource framework has been around for a few years, I still think there's that bit about uh, understanding the data and understanding how each individual area actually use the, the, the health resource, because it, it does vary across the uh, across the park, depending on, on clearly the size of both an urban and a rural area. So, so um, health populations, use of health resources varies significantly across the, 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 the whole the, the patch of across the side. Yeah, well, uh, uh, yes, and I'll let you in. I'll just, if, if, I've get, if, no, if Katie and Marion don't want to respond. Um, I'm uh, very happy. To, we actually do quite a lot of joint work in terms of making sure that we try and keep people out of hospital um, and keep them as close to home as we can. And, and, you know, notwithstanding the integration process, we've certainly got a project underway in Barra, for instance, to try and reprovide yeah. St. Brendan's Hospital and Care Home in, a, in an innovative and joint way. Um, and so I think we can point to a lot of joint working that's, tr that's designed to try and keep people at home. Yeah. Um, but it almost runs in parallel with the integration process at the moment. Yeah. I mean, you know, it just goes back to those targets and what drives the service. Yeah. We heard earlier, <laughs> they're breathing down your neck <laughs> about do, getting those waiting times at E&E &E down and, 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 and waiting times. Then it's... You know, you're not going to get to some of that uh, early uh, preventive stuff. Richard? Yes, sir. Uh, it was really the integrated resources framework that was the thing that interests me. It's been around since 2009, and Tayside are actually, in your Perth and Kinross division, are the most advanced in this in terms of actually what it's delivering. And it's just to ask you all uh, whether that is, you know, we've been at it six years now, you know, Refining that data was really, is really critical to integration, in my view, because it does range across the whole field from uh, general practice prescribing to uh, SPARA data, all these things, the amount of care home use, etc. These are all fundamental if we're going to look at the variations. So to take Tayside, I'm sorry to concentrate on you, Lindsay, but Perth and Kinross are furthest ahead with IRF. Um, but interestingly enough, Angus has one of the highest levels of care home provision, uh, you know, which shows you the variation. And understanding that and the costs involved in that seems to me to be fundamental to the integration process. So I'd just like to ask a question about whether you're using IRF, whether uh, both the health board and the local authority partners really understand what that's about uh, and uh, what effort is being made to actually ensure that that data is available. Because unless we get the data right, uh, then, you know, going forward, we're not going to be able to understand the variations, which may be justifiable, but we need to understand them. Katie, yes. Um, I mean, Derek talked a bit about the strategic plans that are being developed as part of as we move to integration, and within that, there, there is also four locality plans. So in Dumfries and Galloway, we've got four localities, and supporting the um, strategic plans is a whole wealth of data through the strategic needs assessment and also a financial plan. And that's certainly one of the main areas where I would see us using the IRF to really um, influence some of the decisions, particularly at, at locality level. I think we have been challenged over the years, although it's been around for a while, um, the quality of the information that we're getting through the IRF has, has improved significantly over that period of time. And certainly 
one of the things that um, that we've been working around in D&G is around looking at how we um, involve that in the localities, that how we get the locality management strong so that it's the localities who are empowered to make some of the decisions as we move forward. So, yeah, absolutely right. They need to understand the resources that they've got, the you know whether it be people, hospital, money, um, and to be able to have an influence around that. And that's certainly one of the principles of the model in terms of the way that we've set up integration in D&G. I would say it's fair to say we're still in early days, so we're still <coughs> working that through, but it's it's one of the works strands that we're, we're taking forward as part of our implementation of integration through the shadow year. Lindsay? Yeah. I'll maybe come in just a bit, a bit on Highland Perth uh, uh, Perth and Canoes. Highland Perth was the was the pilot for the, the integrated uh, resource framework, and we spent uh, a fairly significant amount of time um, collate, collating the data, refining the data um, uh, over that period. And uh, where it got, uh, I guess, you know, it, we did start to have the, the discussions with uh, not only the general practitioners to, to, for them to help us understand the, the, the resource profile, but also with the, the, the community as well. I think where, we, where we've always suffered, and Katie's, Katie has touched on it, there is significant amounts of data held nationally for inpatient activity down to individual patient level, for new outpatients down to, inpatient, uh, down to individual patient level. At times, we've always struggled with the community data, and clearly to understand the full uh, resource consumption, we need to understand... Um, uh, and at a bit more granular level, the, the, the community spend, and, and that's a bit that's in part has always challenged us, um, although we continue to take work forward in that. Similarly, from a, a, a social work uh, perspective, they're not used to uh, collating data in the, in the way that, that we were looking to, to, to manage it, to, to corral the data. And so, so we use that Perth and Canross experience as a learning curve. Um, Moving to Angus, we can certainly transfer that, that, uh, that knowledge to Angus. Um, we certainly have certainly the significant levels of health data from the, from the ISD database, but I think it, uh, we can, we can uh, provide the data and demonstrate the data in however many manners uh, we can, but I think we do need to think about how do we take that discussion into the, the clinical fraternity and, the, and primary care as well as, as the public. And I think that, that will be a challenge to take this significant amount of data and help people understand. Derek. Um, in terms of Ayrshire and Aaron, we, we, for a long time, have had uh, prescribing budgets down to GP practices, and there's a, a good uh, visibility of that. I guess what then uh, the IRF brought was a visibility around the spend on acute services um, for populations within the three local authority areas. One of the things that we did was, having identified that, compare that to the, the NRAC share of, of that, which um, the, the NRAC is uh, flexible enough and detailed enough that you can go down to that level. And that, that showed some uh, apparent um, overuse by some areas of the population and underused by, by others, which led to some debate around, uh, around that issue. So in moving to the integration of health and social care, I think it was a, a useful starting point. Um, one of the things that we are uh, now doing and actually being supported by uh, Information Services Division of uh, National Services or, or Scottish Government are dedicating data analysts to come out each of the partnerships to help support the, the use of data. Um, and one of the areas that we wish to use them on is uh, what we would call high resource use individuals. So there are a, a relatively small number of people who have frequent admissions to hospital. And uh, if we can identify how best to uh, support them to, to not have to be admitted, to stay in their own home to get the support that they need, then we think that will help with the demands on the hospital sector. Richard, do you? Yes. I think the, the, other, the other question I've got is about general practice because um, I'm really very concerned about what's happening in general practice at the moment. I don't know whether the boards we've got in front of us today have particular problems, but there's certainly in uh, my health board area, Fourth Valley, we've now got 
23,000 patients, three practices where there's no GP partners anymore and the likelihood of at least one more occurring. Uh, we know that there are 26 practices in Lothian, city of Edinburgh anyway, which have closed their list to new registrations. Uh, Stirling, all except one practice, has closed its list to new registrations. And, you know, if we are going to get this integration and this shift, you know, continuing to shift things to general practice when clearly general practice is actually struggling seems to me to be a major difficulty. So I just wonder in terms of, you know, we also know that the, the share of, general, of money going into general practice has, or primary care has actually reduced and the colleges bang on about that all the time and the BMA bang on about it. So in, as part of this integration process, uh, you know, it, uh, how, are you, how are you going to tackle the fact that we've got a really serious developing problem in general practice? Do you recognise that as being reality, or am I, you know, am I being uh, just extrapolating from a couple of areas to saying this is not happening elsewhere? Katie. I suppose just commenting on the D&G position and the, the, the facts that, that you've, you've laid out there, Richard, um, we have got um, around about 11 vacancies currently within GP practices, of, and we know that within the next 18 months, around about 10% of our, our GPs are, are planning to retire, and it is something that we've had considerable discussion um, in, around our management team and our, our board around what, what are the options moving forward, um, not just in terms of daytime um, general practice um, provision but also um, are out of hours because obviously if, if GPs are, are struggling to meet their commitments within uh, out of hours, uh, within daytime then the out of hours uh, is inevitably going to suffer and, and we've had to invest significant amounts of money in, in locum costs to, to kind of support that. Not only that, our um, GP training posts, um, we're not able to recruit the same numbers that, that we would like. I think the latest, we've got four out of 14. Um, and I think the reality is certainly there's no easy solutions for this. I mean, we've looked um, very much at um, different models of, of provision moving forward. So looking at advanced nurse practitioners and, and looking at other um, professionals to be able to, to support models. Um, and we know that um, we've got a really good GP community within within Dumfries and Galloway who are who are committed, and so I think the challenge for us is when we're seeing those really committed and enthusiastic individuals getting really challenged with things, um, then you know that that the reality of that um, kind of hits us, and certainly um, the sustainability of our system when we're talking about things like the the impact that they have on admi emergency admissions and being able to manage people in the community is 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 absolutely critical. I mean, the, the key things that, that we've been um, doing within D&G, aside from looking at the different models, is a, a almost fundamental review of our services, particularly out of hours, looking at um, the national work that's ongoing. Um, we've been looking at our medical recruitment process and really supporting GPs with that, so looking at, at how we advertise and, and how we maximise um, uh, you know, the, the intake that we can get locally, and even looking um, potentially at international national candidates and also which is quite key in a rural area is ensuring that if we recruit people that if we've got if they've got spouses or, or individuals that we we try and work with um, our local partners to kind of find jobs um, for individuals particularly in the more rural areas within within Dumfries and Galloway I suppose I don't have a, an answer for you, a final answer for you on this, um, because I think it is one of the, the challenges that we've got, and I think it's something that we need to be thinking about um, how we take things forward. Derek? You, you asked about the um, overall picture in Scotland. I think uh, Forth Valley is a particular hot spot in terms of uh, vacancies for GPs, um, and some of the rural areas also may be particular issues. So Ayrshire and Arran don't have as many vacancies as, as Forth Valley. Um, we do, ha however, looking at our age profile, have a, a large number of GPs who are over 55 and um, therefore will retire in the not-too-distant future and therefore making provision for that. Um, 
There is, in terms of the investment for 2015-16, uh, there's £100 million pounds of an increase in the Integrated Care Fund, with £40 million of that identified for primary care. And therefore, I think that's been recognised as a national uh, issue to, to uh, see some investment in, in that area. And Those two funds are not separate, then? £100 million, £40 million of it is Sorry. for general practice? Um, no, so there's £100 million that has come out to... Um, to boards uh, for integrated care funds, which is prioritised by the uh, integration joint boards. In addition to that, there's 73 million, uh, which is uh, was retained by Scottish government. Of which, out of that, 73 million, 40 million is for primary care. So there's a total of 173 million. Oh, right. But um, uh, I was just going to give one example of an Ayrshire and Arran. Um, issue around uh, GP out of hours where there is uh, significant pressure and it relates to the Isle of Cumbria where uh, we, we had issues about uh, getting a GP for, for there and in particular if that GP then has to do out of hours. So we are using advanced nurse practitioners, uh, a team of them and they, they're not just based in Cumbria, they rotate between uh, Cross House Hospital and Cumbria so that their skills and uh, experiences is kept up as well. And I know that uh, we visited, I can't remember if it was Orkney or Shetland, to look at the model that they had using advanced nurse practitioners. I actually took members of the public from Cumbria up to see that so that they were satisfied that the, the service they would get would be appropriate. And that's now been working for uh, over a year. Can, can we broaden the responses out a wee bit? Who's responsible for the overall workforce planning for the health and, and social care? Is it... You know, it all seems to be local and in the moment. You know, we've got a shortage of you know, cover for um, you know, out, out, out of our cares for flying people in from South Africa, as it happened in my neck of the woods or whatever. And, uh, you know, who, who, you know, given the context that we we're talking in this morning about the, the, the planning and the spending, who, whose responsibility is it and who's driving the thinking about workforce planning and what the workforce will look like to deliver more health care at home, closer to home, and in the community. Who decides whether it's 50 nurses or 100 home carers? Or, you know, are you, is there any of that going on? I would say in terms of each individual board produces a workforce plan, uh, I think by the end of June, which will all go into the Scottish Government, so there is a consolidation I think the issue, though, around workforce planning is it can take five years, ten years to train up a workforce to meet a future need, and therefore the crystal ball that is required to know exactly what is required in ten years' time. So there are national uh, workforce planning arrangements for things like medical workforce, I guess. Uh, there are yeah. deans of colleges and, and mm -hmm. so forth. So there's almost a... a uh, the inputs that are required into the education system in order to produce the outputs of qualified staff at the end of that can take a long time. Yeah, we, do, we do this with our leaflets. A thousand more nurses, you know, uh, you know all of that. And like a minute. But it, 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 it doesn't meet the requirements you know, that, that we're looking forward to. We're still recruiting for hospitals rather than... It's a clinical workforce, but is there any... Workforce planning that looks at the value of right down to care workers or physiotherapists that, that, that can bring about some of this preventive stuff, can reduce admissions, and who's doing that? It's, it's, it's done, as Derek said, as workforce plans being developed just now for, for, on the health board side of things, and, and they will contain both acute and, and primary care uh, staffing uh, uh, quotas. So in many ways, that, that, that will involve what we have in the current primary care system, and it's all about making that better and improving efficiency. So it, it, in answer to your question, it's sitting with the health board just now. Social work will also be doing their planning. When the IGBs are up and running next year, it will become a joint, a joint process. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, 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 we're just drawing that out. It's not you're dealing with the, with, with, with yeah. the demands that you've got to deal with. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just looking for some you know, a wider uh, a wider approach to, to workforce planning. <coughs> Richard, do you yeah, yes, it was really. Move I mean, you, you moved swiftly, convener, on to my 
uh, thing, because it was partly about general practice, but you know, the responses being advanced nurse practitioner are coming in to, to actually do it, or physician assistants are actually being considered as well. And that, that, that's great. But if we look at what's happened, we had a, we had a, a really quite substantial cut in uh, student intake in nursing. Uh, it's been going on for seven years now. There's been a reduced uh, student intake. Midwifery student intake was reduced. Uh, the FY01 levels in the doctors was cut. The, the specialist training grades were going to be cut by 40 per cent. You know, and that was all around 2011-12. And the numbers actually in the health service dipped. We had 2,500 fewer nurses. Far greater cuts than occurred in England, I have to say, proportionately. And then within two years, we're back up. You know, and I just think, I look at this and I say, well, where's the workforce planning in that? Because as you said, it takes, you know, you have to plan years ahead. So the plan in 2011 was actually five, six years ahead to have a smaller workforce. What was actually happening? How did the workforce plans that you're feeding in locally, could they possibly feed in to a situation that we've got now? Specialist nurses, not just advanced nurse practitioners, specialist nurses in neurology, specialist nurses for heart failure, all these specialist nurses that can keep people in the community, COPD nurses, all these specialist nurses, you can't just create them and not have more nurses coming in at the other end to do the general nursing or to do nursing in general practice. So how on earth can we say that we've got a workforce planning system that is anything like functional? I don't think anybody said that, but Derek... I think, um, and you mentioned 2011 and thereabouts, uh, you'll, you'll recall you know, with the austerity and the budget projections that we had, although um, health would be protected in terms of real uh, terms increase, uh, we were looking at very straightened times with funding uplifts of 2% or, or thereabouts. And uh, in terms of the financial plans, uh, looking at for example, we, we've seen um, increasing uh, expenditure on drugs um, of, uh, very significantly over the last few years. Um, and our other, or our main cost is staffing costs. So if you're balancing between, mm. we know that these costs are going to go up, therefore, and our funding available is, is going to be pretty static, then you have to, to look at the balance there. So I think that was probably the driver for um, any reductions in the numbers of intake into, uh, uh, into the, the professional qualifications was because the years of austerity that were lying ahead of us, um, it, it looked as if that would be required. Clearly, other issues around um, uh, the introduction of the nursing workforce tool, the uh, patient safety uh, focus and the staffing levels in wards has resulted certainly in Ayrshire and Arran in a, a significant increase in, in staffing as a result. So those are perhaps factors that are contributing to that dip and then the, the increase that we've seen in recent years. Any other comments? Lindsay. Maybe just say, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of workforce, may I, I think what we've talked about in Tayside is kind of growing our own uh, workforce. So I think perhaps not looking to the, the, the kind of primary care and community aspect, but certainly if I think of the theatre uh, environment, you know, so, so we've always, we've recognised that we've, uh, we've struggled to recruit to uh, Band 5 uh, nurses. So, so we've kind of looked at opportunities to develop um, uh, support roles and expand the, the labour market. So we're actually looking for a, a complete, completely different profile uh, of workforce. So we're actually potentially giving um, the opportunities of, of band twos and band threes to become assistant practitioners through, through education. And, uh, and I guess also opening up new uh, potential employment markets uh, as well. So, um, we, we do recognise the, the challenge in, in particular areas, but we, we, you know, we've had to think, think differently, uh, recognising that uh, we can sustain the position that we were in. Thanks for that. Bob Doris, followed uh, by Dennis Robertson. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. It's perhaps worth noting that just in the context of uh, workforce planning and, and nurse and midwife numbers that last week the government just announced record levels of staff within the NHS including nurses and midwives so maybe just put that on the record uh, and we can scrutinise some of the figures put on the record elsewhere this morning a bit more robustly at another time and place I would like to I would like to 
Absolutely, Convener, that would be a well-rounded discussion we would have. Um, but uh, I want to look at uh, the budget scrutiny, which, of course, which is the principal function of, of, of this morning. And my apologies, I think, to Mr White in advance, because I've looked particularly, as you'd imagine, at the Glasgow uh, submission. But I was doing a bit of comparing. So I was looking, for example, on uh, emergency admissions uh, through A&E. And looking at that, I saw absolutely that Ayrshire and Ireland have got significant challenges, as does Glasgow. Um, and you know some others faring a bit better. And I, I take on board the demography and ageing population issues around that. But it was in relation to some of the answers we got um, uh, in, in terms of that. And I just want to make reference to to them. So, for example, um, when Glasgow was asked uh, what factors can help to explain any observed differences in performance. Uh, he said key factors are linked to an ageing population and levels of deprivation across NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Now, the other health boards, including, for example, Ayrshire and Arran, identified routes for improvement, and I won't list through them because it's all within the evidence. Glasgow didn't seem to do that. Um, and if I go look at others, so I'll come back, maybe some more information on that would be, would be quite helpful in a moment. But I just want to, again, specifically in, in relation to the evidence, we were also asked about uh, how does this performance against this indicator influence budget decisions? And we got this is an important performance indicator. Significant recurring and non-recurring investment in this area has been made in 2014, 15, 15, 16, but no numbers behind it. If you look at other evidence we received, we get numbers behind it, Mr. White. And the final thing I'll, I'll, I'll refer to is what programmes or services are specifically aimed at improving performance against this indicator? Mm -hmm. Provide three main areas. And, and Glasgow says it's not really possible to give meaningful responses. It could be argued significant elements of community services, expenditure, district nursing, rehabilitation, etc., are geared towards achieving this. If you look at all the other responses, convener, you, you'll find that I, I think it's a, one of the boards, uh, Dumfries and Galley, said it was a complex issue, provided two pages of information, and they did, did actually pick three areas where they'd identified budget and budget increases, as did every other board. I know there's good things happening in Greater Glasgow and Clyde Convener. I just feel the information we've been given in terms of to enable myself as a Glasgow MSP and as Deputy Convener of this committee does not allow me to interrogate those figures. So I suppose it's an opportunity maybe for Mr White to put something on the record of what Glasgow's actually doing to align its budget to improve that particular performance, which is very, very challenging, and maybe for some of the other witnesses to talk about how they <coughs> prioritise budgets to meet that target also. So, sorry for going on at length, but it is budget scrutiny. We have been given significant amounts of information by some of the witnesses, but not very much by others. And I'm trying to scrutinise and compare in relation to this. So, I suppose over to yourself, Mr White. Yeah, I can give you an answer in two parts of that. In terms of the, the submission for Glasgow, can I just point out, I've been in post just under two months, and the submission was uh, completed and submitted before I started. So, uh, can I just say, I haven't read it myself over the last few weeks. Had, it, had I been in post earlier, I would have had far, far more detail in it. So, I, I do appreciate your comment. And, uh, uh, can I promise that next time the submission will be far more comprehensive? Um, in terms of, of where we are with the emergency admissions, it, as I said at the start, it is an extremely challenging position, um, and Glasgow has, has struggled with it. Um, it is not all bad news. We have achieved the, the emergency admission targets, uh, particularly uh, around the Royal, the Royal Hospital for Sick Children, um, across our uh, uh, emergency care centres at the Victoria and Stop Hill. So we have, we have uh, had pockets of good achievement. Uh, along the rest of it, uh, yes, we have significantly invested in, in every other site we have. Um, we have a number of initiatives going on, um, particularly at the, the Royal Alexandra, where we have had uh, a, a real issue. Um, we have had the Scottish Government support team um, out there to, to visit that, and a number of other sites as well. We have taken on board some of their comments. Um, we have allocated specific directors to specific sites to support managers that are involved in dealing with emergency care. Um, we have just spent money at the Western and uh, at the Royal Alexandra around discharge lounges. So again, we are taking steps around that. Um, and obviously, we have got a new surgical assessment area at the Royal Alexandra as well that uh, should hopefully uh, help us to, uh, to achieve those targets. Um, in terms of overall the uh, Glasgow picture, we have uh, obviously the new hospital that has uh, just opened at the Southern General uh, that has involved significant investment. Uh, as I'm sure everyone is aware, uh, and we are looking to significantly improve our performance, uh, particularly around emergency admissions, with the opening of the new hospital. And we have a number of uh, cutting-edge uh, initiatives, if you like, uh, and ways of working at the new hospital that we are very confident will, will bring those figures down. 
Um, so it will bring our figures up uh, and, and address the challenges. So I don't have exactly specific numbers. I'm happy to provide them uh, if, if that's uh, the committee's request. But yes, to, to satisfy or to uh, try and answer the question, we have uh, taken real heed of, of that issue and are, are spending uh, significant money and uh, huge amounts of attention to resolving it. I really did just want you the opportunity to, to put some of that on the record because and, and, and I've have it been grumpy sometimes on a Tuesday morning, Mr. White. I'm just genuinely trying to scrutinise the information available. I suppose Mr. Lindsay did mention challenges that that, that that your board's got, but been quite proactive in trying to tackle those head on. Yeah, um, and could I put on the record as well um, the the way in which uh, I completed the the form that was here uh, about investment. I, I showed additional investment each year, um, and uh, that appeared then uh, to, to show a reducing level where, in fact, it was investment in year one, and then there was further investment in year two and further investment in year three. But um, the, the report that you received notes that um, for most boards there's a planned increase in expenditure, however, for the Ayrshire and Aaron, uh, the, uh, the reduction re reflects lower spending on local and scheduled care action plans. That's not the case. In 2014-15, we invested about £1.7 million um, to uh, provide things like GP assessment. I mentioned the, the Tayside model. We learned from that. We also uh, introduced combined assessment or, or clinical decisions unit. Um, to allow the flow of patients through A and E, so there was significant investment in 1415. Uh, in 1516, we're investing another 700,000 uh, pounds, and in 1617, a further two million pounds. And most of that relates to uh, new builds at the front door of both Air and Cross House hospitals of uh, combined assessment units. The, the capital spend on that is about £27 million. The Cross House one will open up in uh, February or March of next year, and there are additional staffing resources as well as the facilities cost there. So actually, for Ayrshire and Arran, our increase in spend over those three years around uh, unscheduled care is about £4.4 million. I'm just interested to know, Convener, because I mean, both facts, I mean, Mr White didn't have it in his written submission, but the, the two pieces of evidence we've had in relation to emergency admissions at A&E shows that your budgets are aligning to a strategy to, to reduce emergency admissions. Do the other three witnesses have specific budget alignment to achieve uh, progress in that area? Yeah. From a from a D and G perspective, I mean, yeah. we've um, spent not just resource but also a lot of time, essentially redesigning our systems to really improve our resilience um, over the the winter period, um, because that's obviously where we, you know, if a system is going to break or is going to um, be fragile, that that um, we'll do that. So we have developed our local and scheduled care action plan, and that's been. Um, developed in, in partnership with our local authority. Um, and despite the fact that over the winter period we saw you know, kind of higher levels of admissions, um, we have um, sustained the A&E performance that we've had. We've, although we've seen a, an increase in emergency admissions, it's lower than the, the Scottish average. And we've also, particularly over recent months, seen reductions in our, our delayed discharges. And so we've, we've invested resource um, both... Um, the, the money that came through the Scottish Government towards the end of the year on, on delayed discharge, but also additional resource in year to manage some of the challenges that we've had locally. And some of the particular ones have been around um, care home closures and, and some of the challenges that we've had around that. So um, I don't have specific figures for you other than what's in the return, but we have invested more money than over and above what's included within the information you've received. Okay. Yes, Mr. Bedford. Yeah, I'll maybe just mention the, in Tayside the enhanced community care pilot. Um, so, so this was uh, an attempt to try and uh, stop the flow into uh, accident emergency and, and medical uh, admissions, admissions beds. We started a pilot using our unscheduled care monies um, uh, not last financial year but the year before uh, over that winter period. What that demonstrated over that pilot period uh, for, the, for four practices that were involved in it it actually demonstrated a 17% reduction uh, in, ad in admissions to wards, as well as uh, uh, demonstrating a, a reduction in length of stay uh, for, for patients. We've continued with those four pilots uh, over last winter, 
Um, we've now extended that into uh, two areas, both our Angus South locality and our, and our growth, uh, and also into an area within uh, Perthshire. Clearly, it's uh, an area we do continue to believe that um, will we'll benefit uh, not only patients, but also the, the, the flow into uh, the, the acute hospitals. Uh, and that's where we are certainly looking to uh, invest further resource. Thank you. Uh, finally, from Western Isles, I, we've been doing um, uh, quite a lot of work on a much smaller scale, clearly, um, in terms of, and I know this isn't new particularly, but initiatives with Scottish Ambulance Service. So our GPs have been training up paramedics so that they can actually do more assessment of patients at scenes um, and make decisions as to whether to admit or not. Um, we're working with nurse practitioners also to try and take some of the pressure away from GPs. But I would say that uh, in terms of actual investment, it is caught up a little in, in other areas of work that we're, that we're doing, so it would be reasonably difficult to tease it out. But I don't have them with me. I can try and provide that for you if you mm -hmm. wish. Um, uh, but really, from our point of view, it's, it's more around the pressures that we're facing that Richard was referring to earlier in terms of you know, GPs and, and supporting the out-of-hours service, the pressure that delayed discharges are bringing to us, actually all converging to, to, uh, to provide a focus in terms of working to reduce a and &E admissions any way we can. But it's more around uh, service redesign within the resources we've got rather than additional investment. Okay. Okay, I, time for a brief, brief follow-up. Thank you for all, all of that, and it gives us a real sweep across the country of, of, of what's going on. Just in terms of, of emergency admissions themselves, yes, we can prevent them slips, trips and falls strategy with older, frail older people at home and, and that kind of thing. Do we track, when we get emergency admissions about, um, would we count someone who's in there for social care needs rather than for medical needs? <clears throat> would that still be counted in emergency admission statistics if someone comes to a &E, um, they feel the place of safety for that individual would be an admission, but the emergency might be a social care crisis rather than a medical one. Would that still count in the stats in relation to emergency admissions? Would that help inform health and social care integration boards, re, you know, redirecting of funds going forward with, with integration? So, Mr. Uh, Lindsay, my, yeah. my understanding would be if if they. Um, go from A and E and are admitted to a bed, then that will be included for whatever reason. I think sometimes uh, the reason for admission can be, as you say, for, for social reasons. We have tried to, in Ayrshire, we had something called the Frail Elderly Pathway, which was having a geriatrician at the front door to try and redirect, supported by social work. Uh, we've also involved Red Cross um, in, uh, in allowing people to leave A&E without being admitted into um, the hospital um, so as to be able to go and buy uh, some milk and bread or whatever and make sure the person is settled in their own home. So I think there is uh, working with uh, voluntary organisations and others and social work is crucial um, to, to reduce the number of emergency admissions. But I would flag one other issue which is in relation to the seniority of people reviewing, the medical staff, etc., reviewing people when they arrive, because um, often it would be, well, we will admit in order to carry out tests and decide, does, is this person safe? Whereas if you have a senior clinician at the front door who has a tolerance for you know, uh, taking a bit of risk, i.e. Uh, uh, very defensive practices, the opposite of that, but who can take a judgment to say, with the appropriate support, this person can go home and they don't need to come into a hospital for safety. I think that's an important aspect as well. Okay. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add to that. Don't, don't, no, don't just, uh, just yeah. that. I think my understanding is those people would be included in those statistics. Um, I think that is part of the process of moving to IGBs, is that part of the acute function is to transfer to IGBs, so these people then can be dealt with in the proper way. I think to reiterate Derek's point, we've also been taking big steps at the, the new hospital in to, to get that joint medical and surgical assessment at, at the point of admittance to try and get our turnaround rates um, and discharge rates up to about 40 per cent to prevent those, exactly those kind of admissions within the safety and within the mentioned patient quality, so it is a big area of focus. Mr. Bedford, yeah. I'd probably just uh, maybe add a, a couple of statistics. So, if I talk about the, the initial pilot uh, that, that we did that saw the 70% reduction, so for the enhanced community care model, 17 uh, of the referrals into uh, that service 
24% uh, of them were to do with falls. 26% uh, were to, uh, to do with infections. So it kind of uh, ties in with the, 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 the strategy that we're following around uh, slips, trips and falls. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you, Thank, you. Yeah, Thank you very much, convener. I think what we're hearing is that we have a very complex um, uh, issue uh, in terms of a, a probably setting your budgets. Other clinicians, um, or clinicians themselves, are probably looking at the, the outcomes in terms of patient care. Are you driven by finance rather than the, the, the other aspect? Are you able to divorce yourself away from the outcomes of direct patient care and look at the budgets in isolation? And if so, how do you prioritise that? I would say an, an important role of the Director of Finance is um, to be able to bring our professional judgment to bear on what the, the value for money of different aspects are. We spend about 66% of our, our budget on staffing, about 22% on drugs and about 12% on, on other things. Mm -hmm. Is that the right balance? Can we, um, can we evaluate what... Uh, the, the outcome associated with any of that expenditure is. Um, we are assisted in that by people such as health economists or some of the uh, research work which would say by investing additionally in um, this area you can get a better outcome. As I mentioned at the very beginning, we are also influenced by the targets that were set and the achievement and the, the demand that uh, comes from population and demographic changes. So I think finance director's role is primarily about looking after the budget, but also how best to achieve value for money and, and the right balance of spend. Yeah. No further comment? No. Lindsay? Why, one, one comment. Um, there was a report that came out in November uh, this year from the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, um, which is probably the first time for me that, that I actually saw the clinicians getting involved in uh, the debate about how we use our resources uh, effectively. And that report talked about 20% of mainstream clinical practice provides no benefit uh, to, to patient outcome. So that, that's through the, the excess amount of tests, investigations, diagnostic investigations. So I, I think through that, that uh, report, for me, um, was the first time that I actually saw uh, a, a report that potentially allows us to, to have a, a, a better dialogue with the clinical environment, not only in secondary care, but also in primary care, to the referral levels. So, so for me, that, that's certainly a, a route into... Um, helping uh, both the clinical side and uh, ourselves as uh, directors of finance to, to understand the, the resources and how they're being consumed and can they be consumed more, more effectively. You're obviously working with the other directors of finance from local authorities um, to look at the integration uh, of the, 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 the integration of the joint care aspects. Um, together, are you setting out uh, a five-year plan, a ten-year plan with, with regard to that integration in terms of if you look at the efficiencies that you have to have as well, uh, whether it be in uh, prescribed drugs or in staffing, um, are you working with those other directors to see, to see where you can both have efficiency savings but also uh, protect the level of care, whether it be um, direct to a patient uh, or within the community, say, through social care? Mr Lindy? Yeah. Yep. Um, we we uh, do have those discussions with local authority directors of finance. Um, I've been meeting with uh, the local authority directors of finance on a monthly basis for at least a year or a year and a half in preparation for the uh, integration joint boards and the shadow arrangements that we had in place last year. Um, the strategic plan that I mentioned earlier prepared by the integration joint board does have a financial strategy attached to it with um, projections for spend. And we have inherited efficiency savings programmes from both a council and a, a, a health perspective. 
which have to be reflected in that strategic plan. So um, we, we do meet, we do reflect that in the strategic plan. Um, what I would hope out of the integration joint uh, arrangements would be that there will be some synergies uh, rather than us have to uh, look after our own interests. There may be opportunities where um, by working together we can actually do things more efficiently. Yes, the, Sorry, answer to the question. Mr. Yes, we have, I've had conversations with each of my five uh, partner directors of France um, around a number of uh, issues on the, on the IGBs. And we, we we're trying to get you know, people in, in posts. We're trying to work out uh, the strategic plans. We're trying to work out around accountancy and control frameworks. So there is a whole range of consultation and negotiation going on at the moment. Um, I think, as Derek said, the focus has been on. Uh, working out how we can do things better. Um, we are both going to, we, there's no denying we're both in a period of real restraint, so we are both, uh, both parties are always going to have their own uh, savings initiatives, but the, the crux of it has to, and the focus has to be on uh, efficiencies, improvements, uh, and being able to drive uh, out these kind of uh, processes through to the, to the end outcomes and, and make sure that the IGBs do achieve what they're, what they're set out to. So the focus is more on uh, improvement and efficiency as much as um, uh, joint savings. Uh, process here. Are, are you looking at year on year or are you actually projecting into a five or ten year plan? I mean, it, it seems to me that you, you, it, would, it, it would be more sensible to have a long term view. Uh, and I'm just wondering uh, if you're actually doing that, or are you just basing it on a year-on-year -year budget? Mark, the, the, you, you conclude your remarks, and I'll call. Yeah, sure. I mean, the plan certainly that we're looking at are probably around about a five-year plan, based on year-to-year -year budgets. But yeah. we've got to look long term. I mean, the, the IGBs will be. Uh, you know, there are longer term goals in terms of what we can achieve. It will take time, so that's probably the time scale that we're going to base our strategic plans on. Although they are still in draft at the moment. Is that common? Five-year plans, year-to-year -year budgeting? No. Our local delivery plans as a board, um, certainly for D&G, are, are five-year plans, so we, would, we will be developing plans within that sort of time frame, um, really assessing both what opportunities that there are with integrating budgets, but also recognising that there will be challenges and risks around that. How, how, how public are these plans and those discussions and... You know, is the information about the, the objectives, the finances, are they in the public domain? Katie? Can I just Marianne? comment? I mean, um, Derek reflected on the, the strategic plans and the financial plan that will, will go alongside that. So uh, commenting from a Dumfries perspective, we're still in development of that plan, so they're not in the public domain as yet, but they will form part of the strategic plan that will be consulted on widely um, within partnerships. That's what I was going to say. That's common. That's the common approach. Yeah. Is it government guidance in terms of how you prioritise that, or are you just doing this uh, within your own uh, localities? Derek? Yeah, um, the, the timing issue um, is partly down to when the integration joint boards are going live. So in the case of Ersher and Aaron, our uh, schemes of establishment were approved uh, uh, round about the, the beginning of April. The first meeting of the integration joint boards happened uh, in April and they considered their strategic plans. So I think the Ayrshire strategic plans are now in the public domain, whereas um, other boards are at different stages during the course of 2015-16 of having their schemes of establishment approved through the, the parliamentary process. And then the, the first thing that actually makes the integration joint boards live is the approval of the strategic plan. So that all, of, all boards will go through that during the course of this year, but in a kind of staged basis. Mm -hmm. Katie. Just, I suppose, a follow-up to that. I mean, I, I see the process as being a sort of an iterative process. So we, we're developing strategic plans at the same time developing locality plans. So there will be a bit of sort of bottom up from from the localities in terms of the um, developments that they may want to take forward, the things that they think might impact on the service areas or any um, service changes they want to take forward. And also from a partnership perspective, um, you know, kind of things that we want to commission or we think are the right things to do. And I think because we're in the sort of first year of integration that we will, they will evolve over that, over the next kind of two to three years as we, we 
develop as a partnership and, and know a bit more about what it is we want to do and where we want to get to, recognising that there's a performance framework that sits around integration, so there will be need to be a linkage around um, some of the performance outcomes that are expected um, as a result of that. And is the priority to get more people into the community rather than acute services, so therefore you've got your uh, savings in terms of your efficiencies, which might, may not uh, result in maybe um, re reduction of staffing, but in terms of keeping people within the community is, is a primary objective? I mean, absolutely. We know that the, that the models of care that we take forward um, in the future uh, can only be sustained on having um, the resilience within the community and, and um, certainly a lot of the work that we've done so far through um, the change fund, the, the resource that, that, that partnerships received over the last three to four years have been looking at, at what those models might be and how we can develop um, sustainable solutions at local level. Annette Millen. Thank you. I suppose, I suppose my interest is follows on from, from uh, Dennis Robertson's, um, particularly with the last six months of, of care, um, as people near the end of life. And I was very interested in Tayside's approach to the rotational scheme for, for nurses, having them within the acute sector and within the community setting to get a grasp of the, 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 the whole picture. Um, I mean, I think this is quite innovative. And uh, I think it's the sort of thing that probably have to happen in all areas as, as the population really does does get older. So I'm just interested if, if um, uh, Lindsay Bedford could tell us um, what drove you to starting this, this strategy and what sort of challenges you met uh, during it and have you worked out the, the cost cost benefit of it? Yeah, um, I'm probably not in a position to, to, to respond uh, to that uh, question today. The, the, the response that came uh, came really from the, the clinician that was, that's been directly involved in uh, in, in driving our palliative care strategy uh, forward. Um, clearly, we do believe it has had uh, significant benefits for, uh, for, for, for patients. Um, in terms of cost benefit, uh, the, there's, at present there's no analysis uh, that has been done, but so I can go back and Okay. Uh, right. I think it's a very in interesting approach, actually. I would, I would, I'd love to hear a bit more about that at the time to come. Is anyone else any comments about that? I think, it's, I think it's an interesting statistic. I think, on its own, I think it's got to be looked at on a broader basis. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a, are we making sure that people are in the right setting rather than just, you know, the statistic itself, making sure that people have the right choice? So I think it's back to maybe some of the initial discussions we had at the start of the session around some of these performance indicators and, and, and how useful they are and how much we use them. I think that's a perfect example of one we have to look more broadly in, in, in some of the underlying issues and factors that, that dictate that statistic to make sure that we're we're doing it right. Sure, sure. I noticed as well that, that I think Tayside felt that there, there's not really any indication of quality of care in the yeah. statistics being looked at. Is there any comments about that and any alternative way of approaching it so that quality of care can be judged as well? How do we measure that? How do we... Katie. I, I suppose yeah. I'll just reflect on the fact that, um, I mean, one of the things we included in our submission was our Putting You First programme, which was the change programme um, that we took forward through the, the integration resource that we had previously. Um, and as part of that, we had a full qualitative um, uh, assessment done uh, to really look at what how the patient experience had been um, impacted by the initiatives that we've taken forward. Now, it was much broader than um, the end-of-life care sort of example that you've pulled together there, but I think it has to be around um, understanding both the patient and the, the sort of family experience of, of the care that we receive and, and actually being able to, to measure that and understand that and also do something about it. And, and certainly, um, certainly within Dumfries and Galloway, we've had a much increased focus on, on absolutely um, acknowledging that um, within, you know, sort of teams that are working with um, with patients, the, the impact that their interactions can have with a patient can have on, on the quality of care that they receive. And that, that certainly Ken Donaldson, who's our acute medical director, has been um, taking that forward um, you know, across the, the organisation and it has made a measurable impact on, on what we do. 
I mean, my, I mean my, my feeling is that that sort of qualitative assessment will be quite important as integration beds in. <laughs> Absolutely. And just to just see how it really is working in the interest of patients. Because we have to, I think, I'm sure you'll agree with me, we have to look at the outcomes for patients um, <laughs> in, in regard to, to the whole integration. And that's, yeah. why, that's why, why we're doing it. <laughs> and, that, and that is reflected in the national the outcomes that are set around integration and that will be measured as part of that, that process. It isn't just the hard numbers and facts. Thank you. Th th thanks for that, Nene. But um, you know, on 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 this subject, I'm quite happy to take um, you know for five minutes or so some supplementaries on this issue because we've got, we, we, the committee are planning to do some work on end, end of life and palliative care. And, and in terms of the briefing uh, uh, that, 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 that we've got, there there is a different approach to whether board use hospice services, how they're funded. Um, the funding model between uh, uh, the local government and yourselves is, is, uh, is around 25 per cent, I think. Some, some areas are meeting that from the boards is at around 12.5 per cent of the hospice funding. Some, some, some are meeting that, some are not. There, are, uh, there is also, um, uh, uh, in terms of the charge and the children's services there, or particular responsibilities. I don't know where we can explore any of them, and I'm, I'm happy to take brief uh, supplementaries from the committee over, you know, like five or ten minutes of this, if, if it's necessary. Yes, Derek? Yeah, I mean, just on the, the point of funding, um, there is complete consistency in terms of the children's hospice because it's done on behalf of all boards through, through Tayside and, and the contribution, which I think, as you say, is about 12.5%. In relation to local hospices, though, um, the, the target for that is 50%, and uh, uh, I think most boards are, are certainly close to 50% funding of, of hospices. In terms of the quality of services, the person-centeredness, the, the small scale of them, I think they offer a very, very high standard of care um, to, to patients. And just that joint working with the voluntary sector is, as well, I think, is important in palliative care. Uh, so for Macmillan nurses, for uh, hospices in local areas, uh, there's real value added about working with the voluntary sector. Lindsay? I'll, I'll make up uh, the, the, the point around uh, CHAS, the Children's Hospice Association in Scotland. I think uh, uh, the, the table that we provided uh, shows the, the, the level of cont contribution from, from territorial boards as well as the, the contribution through the, the, the Diana nurses funded by, by, by the Scottish Government. The, the figures that, 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 that we obtain from uh, CHAS's uh, percentage of, uh, of their charitable activities um, and I guess charitable activities, uh, from their perspective, is, is the hospices, the care at home, as well as the, the, the outreach um, uh, facilities. If I think of the contribution that, that health boards currently, currently make, um, probably going back to 2009-10, there used to be a, a fairly detailed uh, piece of work that was undertaken each year uh, to reach a... Uh, an agreement on the, the agreed uh, hospice uh, funding level. Um, uh, and that was a fairly uh, bureaucratic uh, process and, and it certainly took a significant amount of time from, from CHAS to provide that. At that time, um, both parties agreed that um, I, I were looking for a more pragmatic solution. Uh, and at that time agreed that uh, whatever baseline uplift that health boards actually received would uh, flow directly to, to Chaz, and that gave them kind of certainty around the planning cycle and, and, and the level of uh, budget that was going to be uh, available to them accordingly. No efficiency savings has ever been applied to, to the resource that, that went to Chaz. I think probably both parties probably do now uh, reflect that um, Chaz do now have a significantly expanded uh, service. I think we all recognise that with medical uh, advances that children and, and young people now need much more, much more complex uh, clinical care, uh, which has led to CHAS having to employ more specialist uh, medical and, uh, and nursing staff. I guess also if we reflect on the CHAS uh, at home service, uh, way back in 2009-10, uh, that was a support worker-led service. Um, 
it's a very, very different model now. It's a nurse-led uh, service and certainly is integral to, to the care of uh, palliative care services. And many uh, uh, roles undertaken by staff within CHAS are not within, uh, within the hospices, hospices themselves. They actually go uh, the, in, out into the, the community. So I think what um, we, we've recognised is with, with that significantly expanding service, we probably do need to uh, go back and revisit the baseline. And we might not do it every year, but perhaps every three or five years, it is appropriate to, to reset that baseline um, so that we can get a, an agreement on the, the, the agreed level um, of hospice funding. And the initial discussions I've had with both the Chief Executive of CHAS and the Director of Finance and Administration of CHAS, they're both uh, in agreement to that outline proposal. So I'll be looking to, to work with uh, the senior officials of CHAS uh, during this year to, uh, to revisit that, uh, that baseline uh, and confirm what the, the agreed hospice running costs are. Dennis, do you... The majority of um, palliative so care is for generally older people, and, and I know we're talking Chas. In fact, Chas has a conference this Friday uh, in, in Aberdeen uh, on, on, on palliative uh, care services. Uh, I'm just wondering, should, should you all be looking at not just the hospice, but in terms of the community support that is there, and are you able to look at the specialist and sort of general um, uh, services in terms of uh, working out how much it actually costs each board? And I noted that obviously Tayside was looking at a 0 0.7 reduction in their, their palliative care services, which seemed extraordinary that, that given that we were, I think, we were actually looking at probably expanding a palliative care. It, it did seem a bit extraordinary. I think I've got another supplementary on this, Rhoda. On this issue? On this issue. Right. Yes, please. And I'll, I'll, I'll get the, I'll get, just, I'll just get the, the panel to respond to okay. both or if anyone else wants to come in. OK. It's, it's more about how we grow palliative care. I think what we get as a committee and everyone we speak to, those who, who are in receipt of palliative care, palliative care um, have really good outcomes and have no complaints whatsoever. Where we do seem to get the problems is the lack of palliative care. Now, it seems in our discussion we're talking about um, the third sector charities providing most of palliative care, hospice, chas and the like. But we re really need to look at mainstreaming this and especially at close to home and in the community. Are there plans to do that and what's the cost of that? How would that impact um, on budgets? And would good quality palliative care actually provide savings because a lot of people at the end of life are admitted to hospital needlessly and indeed kind of they're in a kind of a stressful situation for themselves and their families. Anyone else? Just a, you know, just a supplementary on that is just that, that, that sharper point. Some, some, of, some of the health boards were unable to give us any information about the cost uh, of, of general palliative care that they provide. Is it feasible to ask for that and how could that be done? And, and I think just referring to earlier that, that broad information set that says more people are dying at home is not necessarily, it, it doesn't give us any sense of quality or, or, or uh, and in the case where, where they that happen by accident or choice, you know. So it's those, those issues that we're exploring. And Derek, please. Yeah, I know one thing that we've uh, worked locally with care homes um, in particular because there may in the past have been a tendency if somebody was um, nearing death to say, well, well, we'll take them to, to A&E and get them admitted to hospital um, and therefore to upskill the, the care homes to provide support yeah. to them, training, uh, how, how to support people who are dying and, and, and to die with dignity um, is, is something that we've done locally in Ayrshire and Arran to, to, uh, uh, to try and minimise the number of admissions to hospital, but also to, to really not take people out of their homely environment and into a, a very acute type of environment there. 
Um, I think somebody also mentioned earlier on in terms of the, the outreach service that's provided, and I know in, in Ayrshire and Arran, the Ayrshire Hospice has outreach workers who work very much in the community, and again, we fund 50% of, of that as a service to outreach, so it's not just about people coming into the hospice to die, but they can be supported um, well before that. They may come in in a daycare spaces as well uh, uh, to, to the hospice, so I think there is um, joint working that goes on uh, with the, the, those, uh, those third sector organisations. Anyone else? I see Lindsay and then Katie. Okay, I, I think maybe just to respond to the, the palliative care resource, resources in Tayside. If we look at the, if we had to look at the recurring budgets from for palliative care services in both 14, 15, and 15, 16 you actually wouldn't see uh, any, any differential. Um, Tayside has invested in palliative care services over the, the, the past few years. The differential you're seeing today is just the, 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 actual, few, the actual expenditure that was incurred in April to March 2014-15, um, um, recognising some of the, the operational challenges that, that they had, uh, I'm guessing around supplementary staffing. Um, and that's why there's a differential between that and the recurring budget that, that you see. So there's no uh, reduction in the uh, recurring budget that's available to the service. Good. Yeah, just I suppose to comment on the specific um, question around how do we cost and understand the cost of palliative care services. What, what certainly what we've included in the DNG return is is the those specific specialist services that we provide. So um, specifically the inpatient facility within within the infirmary, which operates as our hospice, and also services that we commission through uh, Marie Curie to to supplement the the community support. What you will find is within all of our community teams, our district nursing teams, an element of their role will be supporting individuals um, who are end of life. And it, it really is difficult to sort of say, well, actually, how much of their day have they, they spent on that? Similarly, um, you know, we are dealing with individuals, not just in our community hospitals, but in other areas of, of the infirm. Uh, the, the main acute hospital that we have. And again, it, it, it's really difficult to disaggregate that, that cost. I mean, one of the things that, that we can do is have a discussion and, and take that away, but it's it's just because we don't, I suppose, count activity in, in exactly that way. And, and we can certainly have a look at it, but it, that's why most of us kind of struggled a wee bit to, to pull that information together. I suppose the following on question is, would it be worthwhile? Would it be worth the effort mm -hmm. To establish, uh, you know, uh, the, the the cost of that palliative care within a hospital setting, would that drive any other initiatives that would take you out of the clinical setting and, and, and pay a greater focus to end 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 of life, I suppose? But no, I certainly think Mark? the fact. Of, yes, I want to. We're moving to to IGBs and joint working, then I think to try and put a cost around it, yes, it probably would be helpful. I think we might end up with some disparities, we might end up with equations on, on, on how accurate that is, but I, I think it would be valid. I'm certainly, if that's a request from the committee, happy to go and take that away. Okay. Um, I've got Rhoda Grant, followed by Richard Lyle. Yes, um, an issue that just really flagged up last week um, with regard to, to patient travel to hospital and the impact that has on budgets. Um, it used to be paid centrally through the Scottish Government if people had to, to travel distances to hospital. I noticed that that's no longer happening and NHS Highland has put huge cuts to the patient travel budget in that someone needs to drive for about 70 miles before they get any uh, of that cost met and when they do beyond the 70 miles, it's a, somewhere around half of the cost that the inland revenue sees for mileage. They've also told people not to take flights, to take ferries instead coming in from islands. And I'm just wondering if other health boards are facing similar concerns and how has this budget been devolved and how is it funded? Maria. Um, well, I, I think we... NHS Western Isles is the biggest recipient of, of uh, patient travel funding, which is now transferred to our earmarked recurring baseline. Um, we get something like £3.2 million pounds, um, in 15-16. We are quite concerned about the volatility of that budget um, because we can have issues in terms of suddenly having to take cohorts of patients to the mainland, for instance, in order to meet TTG 
uh, targets and so on. So, it, so there are uh, uh, significant um, vulnerabilities around that budget. Um, I have to say that we have included in our efficiency plans this year a small reduction at something like £25,000 to try and, uh, and make a contribution towards the total savings target that we have from that budget. I don't imagine at the moment that we'll be making quite such swathing um, reductions as, as Highland, but I have to say that uh, you know I, I can't either rule that out um, because we are struggling to identify the rest of our efficiency savings target. Um, it is a real issue for us and we're very worried about it. The, I think the biggest thing, though, is that actually the people who live on islands do tend to have an expectation that their, all their travel will be funded, and I think there is um, some, there is a question to be asked about the equality of that when you look at people who live on the mainland who are expected to make their own way to their appointments, and sometimes their journeys can be equally difficult. Any other comments on that? Derek? Just to say... I think the Highland and Island or Highlands and Islands travel scheme only applied to maybe four boards. Um, so although Ayrshire and Arran has uh, Arran and Cumbria, we didn't receive any funding for from that. Okay. Move. Um, Richard Lyle. Thank you. Most of the questions. Are, uh, good morning, by the way. Um, most of the questions I'm going to ask have been, already been. Uh, answered, but I was having a look over your uh, submissions, cost pressures and efficiency savings. Um, we all know that you know costs, uh, most of the costs are staff, energy costs and drugs. In regards to your cost pressures, you put in hospital drugs, anticipated price and volume changes 2015-16. Uh, I'll give you a flavour, convener. Ayrshire and Arran assumed price uplift 2% assumed volume uplift 22%. Dumfries and Galloway assumed price uplift 8.7%, assumed volume uplift 2.5%. And Tayside assumed price uplift 3%, assumed volume 5.7%. Now, some of those, Ayrshire and Arran is, is quite, uh, it's not the highest, but it is uh, quite high. But moving on, um, we come to efficiency savings, and this is where it, I, I don't square what, what you're saying to me. Um, Ayrshire and Arran, Dumfries and Galloway and Tayside are planning to achieve around a quarter of their savings from drugs and prescribing. But you're telling us you're going to have a volume uplift, you're going to have a price uplift, but in the next step you're telling us that you're going to achieve your financial savings from reducing drugs. Now, maybe you could explain it to me. Could be the factor that some drugs are dropping off patent or whatever. You know, you may want to pin your mask to that one. Um, but um, how do these two square? You're saying volume and price has gone up, but you're going to, call, you're going to save because you're reducing drugs consumption. You've so got how, your answer, that, haven't you, Katie? No, you've got an answer. Um, I'll maybe just explain a little bit about how we establish budgets. So the, the, we would establish a, a, a drugs budget um, in conjunction with our clinical teams and our, our pharmacists at local level. And what we would reflect in that is the, is the gross cost of that budget. So the, the, for D&G, the 8.7% and the 2.6% the will have been built up from our previous experience of what, what volumes we've seen um, from you know, new drugs that we know are, are either, have either been approved or going to be approved through um, the Scottish Medicines Consortium and any um, kind of local investments or developments that we've made in drugs. So we've reflected that um, gross costs within our financial plans and our, our budgets. Um, what we're doing at the very same time, though, is looking at how we can deliver efficiencies as a board. So um, as part of that same piece of work, essentially, we would look at, at actually there's a range of areas where um, we can look to um, make efficiencies. So if I use volume, for example, we might have seen um, quite significant increases of volume year on year. But that doesn't mean to say that we wouldn't target that as an area that we want to make efficiencies. So um, certainly within Dumfries, part of our um, level of efficiencies that we're looking to deliver in year will be about trying to reduce that volume level from the 2.6 to a, to a lower level. And that's 
not a kind of an unreasonable approach to take. What, what, we've also, what we also are doing at the same time is looking at um, drugs that are coming off patent, the, the normal drug switches, and any other things that um, we can do to um, reduce our drugs budget, because again, our, the principle that, that we've taken forward in DNG is about maximising um, efficiencies that we can, we can make from drugs and, and procurement savings without impacting a, as much on staff savings as, as we can. And so um, what we are seeing, though, is, and I, certainly speaking to my chief pharmacist earlier in the week, um, was two or three years ago, the list of, of drugs that we were looking at for, for efficiency savings was probably maybe about a dozen. We've now got maybe 70 to 100 of different drugs that we're looking at, at switches, maybe, as I say, coming off patent, looking at different ways of, of delivering that. So the whole um, environment has become much more complex, and it is an area where, whilst we're still targeting it as for savings, that um, the level of savings um, we know that we can deliver from there will become reduced over, over future years. So hopefully yes, that Derek. Answer. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned how high the, the Ayrshire and Aran figure is, and I would just flag up that it's uh, hospital drugs that are specifically in that table. And in terms of primary care prescribing, Ayrshire and Aran over the last two years has seen increases in costs. Uh, this is from our statutory annual accounts, averaging about 4 per cent per annum. However, over the last two years, the average increase in uh, other drug costs, which are mainly hospital, is about 15 per cent per annum. And we know that there are new drugs, um, such as hepatitis C, which are very expensive and are being used more. We also know that uh, a, a policy initiative has been to increase access to um, uh, end-of-life drugs, to uh, ultra-orphan and orphan drugs, which again are very expensive. And therefore, we know that um, our costs are, are likely to go up by about 20% uh, or so on that category of drugs uh, over the next year. In terms of the split between uh, price uplift and volume uplift, that is a bit subjective because, um, for example, hepatitis C, it's a, new, a relatively new drug. We will have increasing numbers of patients utilising that drug. So we've categorised that as volume rather than price, whereas if the cost of a hepatitis C drug went from £50,000 a year to £60,000 a year, then we would say that was a price uh, increase. So that's the reason for the discrepancy. Lindsay. Yeah, so uh, if, if reflecting on the, the hospital drugs, um, uh, what our uplift certainly focuses on is the, the growth uh, in established agents, uh, as, as well as the, the, the new medicines uh, that uh, are likely to, uh, to to come to the fore in the year, and that's advised uh, through the, the forward look uh, submission through through SMC. We do work extremely closely with our uh, our clinical pharmacists, so so this isn't uh, finance coming up with figures. This is uh, advised through our our, our our clinical clinical pharmacists. Over the past couple of years, um, it probably used to be that secondary care drugs were, were, were never looked at in terms of driving efficiency unless there was a, a, a drug that was uh, coming, off, coming off patent. But through the hospital medicines utilisation database that's now been developed, we all uh, have the opportunity to try and uh, compare our secondary care spend, which is something we've never been able to do before, apart from at a, a single line level. So we've now got the opportunity through this database to, to see where is the variation in secondary care prescribing. Um, and we believe that the, the, there's potential efficiencies uh, in there that we can, we, we can, uh, we can uh, pursue. In terms of primary care, uh, primary care will, will always be a focus. Um, in TSI, we spend about £77, £78 million on, on primary care drugs. And as ever, we will continue to, to look at uh, driving first-line formula compliance. We will continue to look at the variation um, uh, or the waste and the harm and the variation uh, between our, our respective practices. Um, and through the locality pharmacists that we have in each of the practices, that is where we, we continue to look to drive down, drive down costs. No one else? One more uh, question. 
Politicians during the last election were talking about a seven-day service in uh, hospitals. Um, I, if I caught the, one of the comments earlier, you were saying that if you brought in a surgeon at the weekend to do an operation, you're paying them three, him or her three times what, what the, the normal pay rate is. Most workforces have had their days of working amended over the years. Most people now work at the weekends. Mm. Uh, that's a normal week uh, of working, and conditions have changed in the last 20 years. Um, whilst this is mainly down to hospital managers, uh, but f from your end of the, the costs, etc., what discussions have you had with any of your chief executives in regards to um, looking at how differently we do things in the health service if we are trying to get a truly seven-day service that people are, can be operated on on a Saturday and Sunday or um, uh, different other things that didn't take place before? Derek? There is a national group which is uh, uh, chaired by the director of HR from Scottish Government, but I know my chief executive sits in that group. It's been meeting for about six months to look at seven-day services. Uh, they've produced an interim report, but uh, the work is ongoing. From my perspective, the, the nursing staff already work seven days a week because they're, they're looking after patients in wards all the time. So the main impact is likely to be on medical staffing and the, the uh, change in working patterns around that. We have already introduced that and, uh, to some extent around ward rounds happening at weekends or, or uh, such like. But I think that will be the, the main cost associated with it is changing the working patterns of, of doctors to, uh, to more a seven day pattern. Katie. I'll, I'll just reflect one further thing in terms of what we've done in Dumfries and Galloway to date. Um, because, uh, particularly through the winter period, but because we know that a Monday is always a really high activity day, um, one of the things that we've been piloting is enhancing our AHP support over the weekend period, particularly um, physios and, and occupational therapists. And that, you know, has had an impact on how busy Monday is, which means that, you know, kind of when you're starting the week and particularly through the winter period when, um, when there's, you know, reduced bed capacity, Capacity, that that's had an impact on services. So we are thoughtful about what that might look like moving forward, particularly when we need to be clear what our vision of a, a seven-day service looks like, because it might not necessarily be that we do everything that we do during the week at the weekend. It's about maybe managing some of that activity a bit better over the week so that, um, you know, just because a patient doesn't, is admitted on a Friday afternoon doesn't mean to say they, they automatically have to stay till till a Monday. So I think it is an area of work that we really need to explore and develop, you know, await um, what comes out of the national review and look at, at how best we can implement it at local level and what fits each local system. One, one final question where, where anybody else wants one that takes us almost full circle about priorities being set out with maybe uh, the boards and targets being set out with the boards and, and, uh, and our report uh, in 2014 to the Finance Committee, we suggested that we needed to place more attention on an analysing the performance of targets um, uh, in, in the sense of those targets that are more urgent for change um, and, and leaving a longer period of time, I think we said, for, uh, for revision to targets that have a, low, uh, a lower priority, that prioritisation. Um, do, 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 do you um, uh, have any views on that, that type of approach that, 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 that would be analysing those outcomes and priorities and, and de, de investing in some of them or, or pulling back in some of them and concentrating on others? Um, is it a is it an approach you, you already um, adopt? Um, as um, some targets, are, I think, are, are seen as a lower priority than others. Um, is that a process that does take place? Do you agree with the, the committee's view that within that we need to analyse outcomes and, 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 and prioritise 
uh, efficiently drawn back and having that flexibility to draw back, I suppose. Derek? Maybe just reflect back comments from clinicians that have heard around targets and particular waiting times targets. And clinicians would always prioritise the greatest clinical need as being what should come first. And sometimes they do feel frustrated that um, someone with a relatively minor need has to be treated within you know, 12 weeks from them seeing them or within the 18-week referral to treatment time. Um, where someone with greater need, uh, that, that means they, they have to wait the full 12 weeks or the full 18 weeks. So I think the, there is something about uh, differentiating between the, the urgency and the, the clinical need that's uh, identified by the, the clinicians, um, as opposed to having a blanket uh, for uh, everybody requiring to, to be treated at the same time. Is there, has there been any work done on any analysis done on, you know, we, we assume that, um, that that happens, but has there any analysis been done? I think, I mean, the, the, clearly the, the clinicians on a case-by-case -case basis are, are assessing and if someone needs to be an urgent or a routine and, and they do a, uh -huh. a degree of prioritisation, I'm not aware of something being done on a, a national basis. It, it tends to be more anecdotal than individual. Is there any work happening locally at the boards, Mark? No, I think, as Derek touched on at the beginning, I think in any organisation you have a suite of performance targets. Some of them will be more important than others and some of them will take up your attention and your, a larger part of your resources. I think the, the question of um, should we de-invest or divert resources from certain targets onto others, uh, I think is a question that, that it's board quite question rather than Director Fran's question. We follow our clinical strategies, we follow our local development plans and, and they set out a whole range of targets to which we allocate resources. So there may be an argument for it, but I think it would have to be wider than, than the Director of Finance that, that makes that decision. Some boards suggested in their evidence that um, uh, guidance and priorities should be developed. Uh, is that the justification for it? That you're not best placed to as financial people to set that guidance and priorities. Is that what you're saying? Should there be guidance? Who was it? Who, who, who mentioned in the evidence? I think um, there was uh, some evidence that we received that, um, that we need to have some guidance on. Uh, no, Katie. I'm not sure if it was me that said that, but I think it from, certainly from my perspective, we need to make sure that the targets that we're focusing on are the right ones. And I think we talked a wee bit earlier about um, the flexibility around some of the targets. And, I, and one of the things I reflected was making sure that if you use the access targets in the TTG, that what we do is we get a sustainable, balanced um, demand and capacity model uh, for all health systems. And sometimes, you know, targets can um, skew that a wee bit in terms of uh -huh. um, uh, the flexibility that, that we have around that. I think we have got some of the focus right because we're looking particularly in, at partnership level around things like delayed discharges and things that, that really have a bigger impact on the whole system, not just um, our acute system. And I think one of the things that we've talked about is about not just focusing on, focusing on what we can measure, but actually focus on, on the whole system. And I think as we move into that integrated world and we get more sophisticated in the performance targets that, that we have that sit around that, we need to be thoughtful about, um, you know, the, I suppose the basket of targets that we use to, to measure overall board performance. And as you say, it probably isn't um, us as individuals who are best placed to say exactly what those, those yes. targets are, but we need to think about how we take that forward. Okay. But none of those ideas appear in your efficiency Target. We've talk, talked about flexibility or, or, or uh, about how savings can be made, but none of it, unless it's in you know, the, 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 the productivity savings that they, we hope to, to, you know, to give them, but none of that type of thinking appears when we get to the, the stage of proposing efficiencies. None of that flexibility seems to appear there. Is that a no-go no go area, Derek? Uh, I, I mean, there are things and have been for quite some time uh, around uh, advice we would get from clinicians or public health or whoever around what are low-value procedures. So, um, you know, is it adenoids and grommets and, you know, certain things that they say, well, we, should, we really should be doing less of these. 
and therefore we can monitor and, and the may, that may move to the extent where we're going to issue advice to you know ear, nose and throat consultants we shouldn't be doing any more grommets but there oh. will always be exceptions so there are some clinical advice that we have and have implemented over a number of years in, in those areas Okay, I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's any other questions. It remains for me to thank you all for your attendance here uh, and the time you've given to written evidence. I think we continue next week with uh, the Director General of Health, uh, NHS, Paul, Paul Gray, and uh, thank you all for your time today. Suspend at this point until we set up for the next panel. Thank you all. Thanks.
We now resume uh, our committee meeting by moving to agenda item number two. Sorry for delaying our witnesses there. We've had a, a, a long session. Um, uh, the second uh, item, of course, on our agenda is the evidence session on smoking prohibition, children in motor vehicles, uh, Scotland Bill. Uh, and this is the first panel of witnesses that we've, we've had to give evidence to the committee on this bill. So we welcome Dr James Kant, um, uh, head of British Lung Foundation Scotland in Northern Ireland, uh, Sheila Duffy, um, Chief Executive of Ash Scotland and David McCaughan, Policy and Public Affairs Manager, Scotland British Heart Foundation. Um, uh, and uh, they're, they're all members of the Scottish... Co oh, Celia. I have Celia. Uh, uh, well, I've, what, what I'm doing, I just noticed you there, but I got it in my brief. I'm introducing all of the others here uh, uh, as, as members of the Scottish Coalition on Tobacco. Back uh, uh, and of course we have Celia Gardner, Health Improvement Programme Manager, uh, Tobacco NHS Health Scotland. Welcome to you all. Uh, I'm going to proceed to questions uh, immediately by taking the first question from Richard Lyle. Thank you, Convener. Convener, I have uh, an admission to make. I'm a smoker. I smoke in my car. Um, Basically, if we go back 20, 30 years ago, uh, maybe not the done thing nowadays, but 20, 30 years ago, most people, I, I smoked my car when my, my kids were in the back. Um, they're now growing up, but uh, my, my daughter doesn't smoke, my son doesn't smoke, and now my wife doesn't smoke. Um, but basically, the situation is that this bill will... Um, as far as some people are concerned, invade their privacy, invade their sitting in their car uh, smoking. I actually am leaning towards this bill and, and don't smoke in my car now when my grandson or granddaughter is in the car. Um, but still, what effect do you think bringing this bill in will, would have a, in order to uh, help uh, children uh, what, what effects at this moment in time are there on children? And also, what would you say to the person who says, it's my car, I'll just put the windows down and, and the air will blow through and, the, and, and the, the smoke will go out the window? You know, Because in one of your submissions, someone put, I think it was the Lung, British Lung Foundation, maybe not, um, you know, uh, will we'll exempt convertibles because the, the, the people have put their... If it's going to be no, no smoking on, in the car when uh, uh, children are in the car, why shouldn't it be um, that there should be any smoking at all when children are in the car, rather than exemptions for convertibles or whatever? I'll start on this one. Can I, can I just begin and, for the record, make a declaration of interest that uh, neither myself nor my organisation have had any contacts, financial or in kind, with the tobacco industry or any similar vested interests. I, what I'm about to tell you may surprise you. I have been in post with the British Lung Foundation for five and a half years and I have not yet told a single smoker to stop smoking. And I never will. Because it's not my job to judge in any way, shape or form. I, and had it not been for a, a slightly different twist of fortune as a teenager, I would probably be smoking in my car as well at this point in time. This is very much a case of working together with adults, whether they smoke or whether they don't smoke. This is absolutely not an attack on smokers. And again, this may surprise you, I have on a personal and organisational basis defended the rights of people to smoke within the confines of their own environment. And you have an absolute pledge from our organisation that while we want to work together to protect the next generation's lungs, we were always, always there to support people whose lungs have been damaged for, for, for whatever reason, without any prejudice or judgment involved there. In terms of the convertible, uh, you may not be surprised how much esoteric thinking went into whether or not there should be a ban on convertibles or not. And I would like to think that the, the approach that the BLF is proposing is a pragmatic one. Uh, and 
we are trying to have something that is seen to be enforceable and sensible. And one of the things that encourages us in that respect is that the most recent figures show that 85% of the adult population are in favour of this control. And crucially, 72% of those people who smoke are also in favour. And we would not want to lose that level of support and consensus if we were being seen to be particularly dogmatic when it came to something like a convertible. It's absolutely crucial, however, to differentiate between the impact of secondhand smoke in a convertible, or lack of, compared to, for example, the impact of secondhand smoke in a car, even when the windows are wound down. And we're in a very fortunate position nowadays because we actually have the ability to have precise measurements of the level of PM2.5 within a particular environment. Uh, Dr. Sean Semple and his colleagues at Aberdeen University are world leaders in this. And what their long-term studies have shown is that even with the windows wound down, you would still be, any passenger within the, the, the car, but it would still be encountering average levels that would be more than 10 times the WHO safe level of, of PM2.5 exposure. And a crucial point to get across before I finish is that it's important that we realise there is no safe level of exposure to secondhand smoke, given the number of toxins within the, the chemicals themselves. I would like to uh, make the same declaration of interests for the record as Dr Kant made. Um, and also to uh, say that we are not anti-smoker, but that we believe that this legislation is proportionate and needed because of the level of damage that tobacco smoke does. And it does particular damage to children. Um, there is excellent and substantive evidence on that. But we were encouraged when we commissioned YouGov um, earlier this year, they did the field work in late February, early March, um, among adults in Scotland, and they found that 85% of Scottish adults overall and 72% of smokers supported legislation to end smoking in cars with children under 18. And the research shows us that both that there are very high levels of uh, tobacco smoke in cars where someone's smoking. It builds up very quickly. We know from other research that short-term rapid exposure um, does create damage, disproportionate amounts of damage, heavy damage. Um, and we know, again, as, as Dr Kant said, that just winding down a window, putting on the air conditioning, blasting the air through the car does not sort that damage. Now, in Ash Scotland's response, we suggested that any car that was 50% or more open could be exempt because that was in line with the principles that were put in place for enclosed public spaces. David? Um, on behalf of myself and the British Heart Foundation Scotland, I'd just like to echo um, Dr Kant's um, declaration at the beginning there. Um, I just wanted to pick up on Richard's point about what's the effect on the child. Um, there's been a number of studies into this uh, related to cardiovascular disease. Um, a systematic review in 2011 showed that children had altered cholesterol profiles and had lower EDL, which is classed as a protective um, sorry, HDL, the protective cholesterol, um, when exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, also, in a study of 11-year-olds, it was shown that they had endothelial dysfunction, which is a effect in the inner lining of the, the blood vessels, which leads to atherosclerosis, which is the thickening of the blood vessel, which ultimately leads to coronary artery disease, which is your, your heart attack um, waiting to happen, essentially. So... Um, you know, clear evidence here that secondhand smoking in children leads to um, cardiovascular disease. And, and in that study of the, the 11 year olds, it was, it was shown that this was already occurring in kids that only had moderate to small um, exposure to secondhand smoking. I think I would just echo uh, Dr. Kant's comment as well that I think this clearly shows that there's no such thing as a safe level of tobacco smoke. Um, I would also echo the statement made by my colleagues about not having any links to the tobacco industry. Um, I think the important thing about this legislation is it's about protecting children. It's not about getting at smokers, which is what my colleagues have said. And the important thing is that, that children, a car is a confined space, and when children are in a car where somebody is smoking, they, they breathe faster, they absorb, the, they have smaller airways, they absorb the smoke much more quickly than an adult does. And I think there's a bit of a general misperception by the public that if you wind down the window, it's safe, that there's fresh air coming in. But we know it's in the chemicals that are in secondhand smoke 
as others have said, there is no safe level of second-hand smoke. So it's important to put this in place to protect our children. It's not about having any um, baggage with smokers. We need to do that to protect our children. And smoking, uh, second-hand smoke exposure in cars can just build very rapidly and to get to very high concentrations. And so we, we mustn't expose children to it. I've got Mike first, then Colin, uh, and then I'll take you in, Colin, and then Dennis wants him. Mike? Thank you, uh, and um, I am a former smoker. Um, I, I now use e-cigarettes, and uh, I am uh, very pleased that I've been able to encourage a few colleagues to take that route out of smoking. And I'm very pleased also that, my, just like Richard's, my children, who are adults long since, don't smoke. But, um, and, and I have to say I'm in favour of the general principles of the bill. But if you allow me to play devil's advocate uh, just for a moment, um, isn't this the thin edge of the wedge? Isn't it the case you've just said um, that there are no safe levels of smoking? So the logical next step for this bill is to move from cars and enclosed space to homes, another enclosed space, because there are no safe levels. And then pretty much to a complete ban altogether. Now, um, I'm not so sure that I would be absolutely against that, but isn't it the case this is really just the thin edge of the wedge? Sheila, I think... I caught you shaking your head there, so you're first up this time. Um, I have not been aware of anyone calling for legislation in domestic settings. This is about legislation in vehicles where you have other forms of legislation that apply, for example, to do with wearing seat belts, installing uh, car child seats, um, not using mobile phones while driving, that kind of thing. So, so we are used to legislation within vehicles. It is legislation that is aimed at protecting children in a very enclosed, concentrated environment. Um, and it is warranted by the high levels of evidence about harm from tobacco smoke. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to come in as well. Uh, as you know better than I do, uh, politics is the art of the possible. And this is possible. Uh, this is achievable. This is something that already has significant support. I can, I can assure you that, as Sheila says, there is not an organisation that I have worked with, and certainly nobody within my organisation, who imagine it to be conceivable, feasible, or at all going to be happening, that we will be moving towards banning smoking in domestic properties. I, I, I think at that point, from a civil liberties point of view, it just would not be feasible and it would not be supportable. Here we have a situation where the minute any of us get into a car, we immediately place ourselves under quite a significant list of restrictions and expectations to keep other road users safe and also passengers within our own car as well. And Scotland has set a phenomenally ambitious target to go smoke-free by 2034. So that's defined as 5% smoking or less. And what we need to do to achieve that is we need the actual mixed suite of activities. Most of it, the vast majority of it, is going to be the change of behavioural norms. There are very, very few situations where specific, discrete pieces of legislation can encourage that change in behaviour, but as Sheila says, also crucially provide that protection. So I would, I would, I, I'm glad that you've raised the issue because I think it's a very, very important one, but I would assure the committee that I see this as no way at all as being at, at, at the beginning of a, a creeping sense of legislation. This is a specific, carefully targeted and measured piece of legislation and should be seen in that light and should be seen against a wider uh, campaigns been undertaken in partnership between ourselves and Scottish Government and NHS Scotland uh, to increase awareness of smoking uh, in, in, in the home. Uh, take it right outside is an excellent example there. We're, 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 we're not telling people not to smoke. We're telling people that if they will smoke, smoke in a way and in a place that keeps their family safe. You'll forgive me if I'm as a... now a non-smoker, a bit of a zealot now in this cause. Mm -hmm. I'm enthusiastic, but um, I have to say there's a logical inconsistency here. Um, the, the damage to our lungs through smoking is, is a function both of the size of the enclosed space and of the amount of time we spend in that enclosed space. So, 
you know, and the logical inconsistency I would put to you is that your position on, on an outright, a ban, for instance, in homes is scientifically and logically unsustainable. And um, the, there is another argument about public opinion and about um, public and civil liberties and public freedom and so on. Um, I think by pretending that argument doesn't exist, you're doing this cause an injustice. Um, you're attempting um, to be um, not explore the issue fully and in the round, and therefore um, I'm disappointed at the answers that you've given, but may maybe you want to reflect on that and add to what you've said. Sheila. Yes, I'd like to add, please. Um, I think one of the benefits of having this debate and having this legislation up for consideration is it will raise public awareness that tobacco smoke is in itself a harmful, damaging substance. And we have evidence from other countries that people have voluntarily introduced additional restrictions when they have got that message. We know from the refresh work that Ash Scotland did with the universities of Aberdeen and Edinburgh that Parents and carers want to protect their children, but they don't always know what's effective to protect their children. And the overall aim, as James said, is to put tobacco out of sight, out of fashion, out of mind for the next generation. So we would like to raise the awareness of the harmfulness of tobacco smoke. It is always harmful. But this piece of legislation is timely and it's possible. The Republic of Ireland has introduced it. England and Wales are on track to introduce it in October. And, and it's on the table here, so we are supporting this legislation. Thank you. Uh, I now have Colin Keir. Thank you, convener. And since we're all owning up, I'm not a, a smoker, never have been, and personally, I hate the things. Um, that said, and uh, there is this touch of um, uh, similarity between what uh, Mike McKenzie said, you know, acting as a degree of devil's advocate, we have a situation where a child grows up in a home with two heavy smoking parents. What would, how, how, how would you be able to measure the, um, the damage done to that child who's living in that environment all the time to the point where they get in the car and actually sort of drive away? How can we justify taking this action um, and what sort of measurements would you see and how would we measure these outcomes? David. I mean, um, from a cardiovascular disease point of view, I mean, the, the figures are fairly stark. I mean, the exposure to secondhand smoke increases your chance of stroke by 25%, increases your chance of coronary heart disease by 30%. So I think you know, the, the message here is very much around a child protection message. This is about making sure that children during car journeys are protected. And, and, and I understand the, the devil's advocate um, argument here of, is this not the next step in the House? And I think you know, British Heart Foundation, Scotland, like Ash Scotland and, and BLF, would, would say that we're here today to talk about the exposure in cars, and that's the bill that's on the table. Um, we equally supported the Scottish Government's Take a Right Outside campaign. And someone once said to me that it's easy to take outside in the home, but you can't take it outside in the car because it's moving. And I think that's a very valid point, that if we're on long car journeys or short car journeys and someone <coughs> lights up a cigarette, you, you, you can't take it outside. It's a confined space that people are, are, are all, you know, trapped in and have to take part in the second-hand smoke, if you would. But the, um, I think the interesting point about the, the Take It Right Outside campaign as well was that it challenged the conception that you can hang out the window and have your cigarette or you can open up the kitchen window and smoke in the kitchen. That, that doesn't work in a home, it doesn't work in a car. And, and, and that is why we, we are calling and, and supporting this bill to, to, to ban it outright in cars when, when there are children present. Yeah, my question is still the same, though. If they're living in that environment and maybe the parents are not, you, do, you know, going out the back garden or, you know, if they live in a flat or somewhere like that, to go outside <laughs> and have a cigarette, how do we... How can we measure the... There's obvious damage being done in the house. How can you measure this, uh, taking it into the car? What makes that so much more dangerous than living in the environment all the time? I mean, I, I, think, um, I think to measure the, the exposure from in the house and then moving into the car, it would be a, 
I think would be a challenging one. I mean, I suppose my my argument would be that at least it's given the child a break when they're in that confined space and they're not exposed to those such high levels. Um, from a British Heart Foundation point of view, we see it as a um, almost a status of, of that, that you can't smoke in a car. I think um, Sheila pointed to it earlier that it, uh, is another opportunity for us to educate people on the harm of secondhand smoke. Um, and that was what the Take Our Essay campaign was trying to do as well. It wasn't telling people to stop smoking that, but educating them. And I think, I think that's a real root cause here. We're not telling people that they should stop smoking completely, um, much like the British Lung Foundation was saying. We're saying here that you shouldn't be exposing people to secondhand smoking. And quite often that's a challenge. People will understand that if they smoke, they're consuming the smoke they're, they're, and, the, and the chemicals that are involved in it. But actually, it's about um, understanding that the people around you are, are being exposed to that as well. And I think an adult would have the, um, the ability to say to someone in a car, don't do that, please don't do it, may even have the um, respect of the driver. But you know, a, a child may just sit there and, and take part in their journey. So it's about giving this ch the child an opportunity to be protected in, in this space. I think they're... they're you know, I would argue that it's, it's, it's hard to differentiate between smoking home, smoking a car, if a child's going from the same um, areas and, and experiences. But I think what, what we've got to look at here is where children are protected and, and educating those people who are smoking the car that the, the secondhand smoke is bad. It doesn't matter if the windows crank down a little bit. And some, some other people might have views on that as well. Sheila? Um, I believe there are two recent studies from New Zealand that showed an increase in voluntary restrictions in the home following smoke-free legislation and some evidence of protection for children from that legislation. But I think also in this legislation you would be um, listening to the voices of children because there is documented evidence that children say that they feel choked and, and nauseous in the car, that many of them would like to ask people not to smoke in the car, but much fewer of them have actually been, felt able to do so. Just to comment on that, this, this should be seen as complementary to the, the, the ongoing advertising campaign, take it right outside. The, the, and, and the beauty of the narrative of, of that particular advert was that the parent was trying to do the right thing. She was at the back kitchen window. She shooed her husband to shut the door when he came in because she thought she was doing the right thing to help protect her child. What it helped to convey was two absolutely critical things. More than 85% of secondhand smoke is invisible and has no smell. And the reason for that is because it's caused by particles that are one twentieth of the size of a grain of sand. And that's, so there's a huge education programme that has to take place as part of this as well. And this would provide a wonderful opportunity to dovetail those messages. The child you describe there's a very good chance the child you describe in your scenario would be attending the local sick kids hospital because the figures from Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh indicate that over 4,000 new cases of asthma, wheeze, glue ear and the like will appear in Scotland every year, almost certainly as a result of secondhand smoke. We can't differentiate for ethical reasons to what extent that took place within the home or within the car. But what we do have is an opportunity to make a clear statement and I would see this as in, in something within a couple of years' time, or sooner than that even, where people look on this in the same way that you look on putting a child in their car seat. You have to put the seat belt on because that's what you do to keep the child, a young person, safe during that journey. And as Sheila says, the, 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 the emerging evidence that we have, particularly from, from Australia, who are pioneers in this, is that there is, there is a knock-on, a very positive knock-on effect. Because to come back to the devil's advocate question, the thing that we face most, most often is the allegation that we want to help you to become the nanny state. This is not what this is about. This is engaging with the population of the adults in Scotland today to ensure that the next generation are able to break that chain in the way in which your family have done already. Can I, can I just ask uh, yeah, on. Uh, one more question? Um, I think you mentioned something about 50% um, open space in the car. Um, what? I know this sounds really odd. You know, we all kind of know what a cabriolet is and whatever, but how is it defined and how would you expect it to be defined in terms of um, practical enforcement? This was just a rule of thumb and it was to bring it into line with the rules that have been put in place for enclosed public spaces. Um, because what we do know is that 
opening windows in your car and, and turning on the air conditioning will not sort the problem of tobacco smoke that is still there in sufficient quantities to be considered harmful. And so that was really just a rule of thumb that we suggested. I mean, I, I just say this because of the fact that um, a normal cabriolet with a, fo a fold-down back roof, for instance, and then you have something like a C a, an old T two CV that has windows up on well, the front, the sides, and mm. perhaps the roll down. How do you? How would you? I mean, there's got to be a difference in air circulation round about there as well. You know, I know this sounds well, really I'm mundane, but the the fact is, you know, these different designs exist, you know. I mean, what I liked about smoke-free enclosed public spaces was the simplicity of the guidance. You know, it was, it was very clear and simple. And, and then perhaps working out what fitted and didn't fit was less clear. But I think, mm. you know, to me, that's in line with the, the existing legislation. Okay. I presume there's no support for exemptions for convertibles in, from the panel in the it, bill. If it's more than 50% or 50% or more open. I have to confess that, that we're relatively relaxed as to whether or not the eventual legislation contains cabriolets or not. My experience of going through Easter House uh, in, 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 in our recent summer weather has not indicated many 2CVs or, 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 or cabriolets, certainly not with the roofs down. So for us, that, that's, that's a, a relatively minor detail. We're much more focused on the, the more significant message. Mm -hmm. And we would, we would, from a BLF point of view, we would certainly defer to your wisdom on the cabriolet question. I just think in terms of enforcement, it's... This is just a problem for the no poor. Exactly. identify. Well, in, in, increasing, increasingly... Increasingly, exposure to second-hand smoke will be very much... will have a social and economic element to it. Because what we've seen in terms of the, the smoking rates is that Scotland is doing very well in terms of encouraging reduction of smoking within the more affluent communities. That This is an absolute inequality issue as well, yes. How, how, how have reflected their opinion and, and how they view this, this legislation as they view recent legislation and smoking in public places? That's an absolutely critical element, and, and a lot of our work has been geared to working with children in some of Scotland's most deprived communities. We're, we, we've done some work in, in Easter House to develop some messages. Sheila mentioned previously that very often children feel disempowered they feel as though they, they don't have the authority or the voice to be able to speak in that way. So we've actually done some extensive work uh, at, at, across some of Glasgow's more deprived areas, and we're currently doing it in Forth Valley as well. Because for us, it's absolutely crucial that children are given the voice, but that entire communities are taken along in this way. Because I think you're very right to highlight the danger that many people do feel as though health is done to them rather than with them. With the smoking ban, that's certainly the case, isn't it? It hasn't. Significantly, you know, you know, there's, we see evidence of that every time we walk along the street, outside pubs, clubs, whatever, whatever it's been. Exclusion for their point of view, yeah. is it not? So, how do we know that that group of people who this would, as by, by your statement, directly impact, are they in favour of that? Have we done any work, you know? quantitative surveys or anything like that, with that group of people who were targeting here, I think. Well, there, Celia? There, there was um, quite a lot of work done um, with the Take It Right Outside campaign last year. A lot of promotional activity was done targeted at um, parents in more deprived communities. They did it outside, you know, little and supermarkets like that. And this was basically kind of educational work. And what was reported back, well, a lot of the parents were saying, I didn't realise that the, you know, there were all these chemicals within secondhand smoke. And it's this perception that if you ventilate or open windows and you can't see the smoke, there's no harm. Whereas what we're talking about, it's, it's invisible to the eye, it's there in the atmosphere, and people breathe it in. Um, You'll have also had submissions from the University of Aberdeen and all the work they've done with the dilos meters that can actually measure the amount in, in the air. And James and the BLF have done a lot of work on this and placing it in deprived communities. 
So we know that there's a, a real educational need, that there's a misunderstanding about what the harm is from secondhand smoke. And it'll be really important if this legislation comes in to build on that education and make sure that parents are aware of just what harm and how it's harmful for their children and about what they can do to protect their children. Because most parents, they want the best for their children. They don't want to knowingly harm their children. And so there's, there's a kind of gap in knowledge here, and, and we're working at breaking that down. And I think once this is generally better understood, the difference between not seeing smoke and the harm still lingering there in the wake can dissipate throughout the house very quickly, um, then we'll be making progress. I think we've got, to, we've got to accept that that message hasn't got through to that, no, that group. As, as, you know, so that takes us to enforcement. So they're not listening, they don't understand, they won't listen, whatever. So we're legislating now. So how do we enforce that legislation? Well, I, think, I still think there's a big education need here. It's not we've, that they're we've, not we've listening. Failed, see, see, if we, uh, uh, we've failed in many respects. I, I know there's a change of behaviour, but... Well, I don't that, think that's the group where there's still most the, 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 the most amount of people smoke, and that'll be related to social economic problems. That you know, that's you know, if you're living a sad life, you know, the, you know, having an extra five years in that life <laughs> and, isn't something they're going for, and they're not receiving the educational mes messages. Many of them are still smoking. They're smoking when they're pregnant. They're smoking. Uh, uh, at home and with children around, they're smoking in cars. And mm. That's a target group. You, can I, there's, there's several different things in there. What I would say is we're not targeting an educational message that's about stopping smoking. The message is about protecting their children, and I think that's a different message from giving up smoking yourself. It's about how you do the best for your child. And I think people are open to hearing that message. I don't I mean, see, see, maybe I'm, I'm not up to speed in this, but in those hard-to-reach communities, we are struggling to reduce smoking prevalence while they are pregnant. Oh, I know that. So just saying, you know, that... We, we, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's when you would think that we would be more responsive to the message about the protection of the health impacts of their child, not when they're there and in the back of the car. So it will not necessarily run that this, that this will have a, an impact on this community, is it? James? I would, I would be very happy to invite you out to some of the community work that we do. And I think you would be actually very heartened at the impact that these messages have upon the young people themselves, the parents' generation, and crucially the grandparents' generation, because, as we all know, grandparents have huge influence and also have huge practical significance in terms of childcare as well. This is something where, when we go into work in a community, we work, we work with the community, but we seek to work with families across the generations. Mm. You, and I think it's very important to differentiate, as Celia highlighted. This is not about us trying to stop people smoking. This is not what this is about. This is about protection of the next generation. The point that you raise about smoking in pregnancy is, is of huge importance. I would actually say that that increases the priority and importance that should be given to this particular piece of legislation. It also increases the importance of making sure we get across key messages. Uh, so, for example, many of those who, who will be smoking while pregnant in deprived communities may have a sense of fatalism of, or despair. Critical message to get across is that if you smoke during the first trimester, the stats tell us that your baby should be born unaffected by the impact. So there's an imperative there to give up within that first trimester. So the messaging is absolutely critical. But the work that we've done with communities is actually encouraging. And I think what we need to do, if Scotland is going to achieve its ambition by 2034, we need to take this on as a society. We need to see this as something that's empowering. We need to recognise that if you as a couple are smoking a pack of 20 a day each, then by the time your child reaches 18 or 21, you could have had £100,000 that you could have given to that child. Mm. That's, that's how Scotland needs to address the way it is. But to come back to the specifics of this, what attracts us and what, what, the reason we're so supportive of this is because we see this as being a particular piece of legislation which has immediate 
and long-term impacts in terms of safeguarding children's lung health and has very, very significant support, not just from the population as a whole, but crucially from those people who yes. smoke. But we're at the stage. The bill's about legislation and enforcement. So if it had been, if it, if it had been all wonderful and the messages we're getting across, we wouldn't be at a stage where we're legislating and enforcing. That's, you know, so there are, as well as the legislation, there's a continuous, I hope, of that educational message, refining yes. our public messages and, and, and specifically targeting those people who we're talking about here. It's not the wider population that we're talking about. That's the point that you made and I agree with. But we are talking about legislation here and enforcement. So we anticipate that, that, that some people will not listen to that message. So how, you know, how, how, how do we uh, ensure that this is enforced effectively in terms of the bill? Sheila. Um, I think you're right to flag enforcement. Um, and our belief would be that the police, uh, because they routinely are out checking vehicles, enforcing other legislation, would be best placed to monitor and be part of the enforcement in this. And we're aware that environmental health the Royal Environmental Health Institute for Scotland has also said that they would be happy to work with the police to enforce this properly in Scotland. And I'd take you back uh, to the two pieces of New Zealand research I mentioned previously following the implementation of smoke-free legislation. And they uh, concluded that um, there was a, a drop in the likelihood of children going on to take up smoking as a result of smoke-free legislation in vehicles, which was independent of smoking in the home and other areas. So I think this, for me, this legislation looks like an investment in the next generation. Yes. And do you, do you believe you'll have the support of these hard-pressed communities who are enforcing smoking legislation in cars rather than scarce police resources being used to tackle the money lenders, the violence, the drug dealers in the street. We would divert people, police, away from that to enforce smoking in cars. Well, we would hope it could be done as part of their regular traffic duties rather than be an additional significant burden. I, so, just to come in on that point. I, the parallel I look most closely to is in terms of seatbelts and what, you've, what, what we found was that it, it, when legislation was coming through, it gave a priority and a significance to this element of parental, grandparental safety, uh, which it may not otherwise have had. It also allows an opportunity for advertising campaigns, which really get the message across. Yes. We would, I, I, I don't think we would for a moment anticipate diversion of actual police officers to this. I very much agree with Sheila's point. We would see it as being part of, of the ongoing police activities in terms of road traffic offences. But you would accept it's a, it's a finite resource, the number of police officers that we have, the others who could carry out similar work. And, and, and if, were it not for the fact that this is something which causes permanent and sometimes fatal impacts on children in Scotland on a daily basis, I would not be pushing I, for I that. I accept your position on this. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of drink driving, seat bell, mobile phones, they are all specific, in many cases, specific campaigns in and around Christmas or summers and on particular roads. Are, they are, they are, these initiatives are usually information-led. Uh, you know, so... You, With the you, back you, of legislation. You, you, you are. Unless it's, uh, what you're saying is it's just an add-on. There'll be no specific campaigns to do this. It's just when they're out doing, you know, a road check or a seatbelt campaign or a drink driving campaign... Uh, then that would be that would be added on. Is that what you're suggesting in terms of the the the, 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 the police enforcement? Um, British Heart Foundation Scotland doesn't have a position on how this should be enforced, but the examples you gave there, um, I suspect Police Scotland and, and whoever runs the campaigns decide when to do them. Drink driving's done round about Christmas period. Um, uh, I'm sure it wasn't thought of in the very first instance when we imposed drink driving that it would be a Christmas campaign. So there's no reason why the Police Scotland might not decide to say we will have 
a week at the beginning of the summer holidays to, to crack down on this. But I think the point that James made is a really valid one that um, it gives us an opportunity to, to raise the profile of this issue and educate through, through, the, through the legislation. And, and the things you mentioned in terms of mobile phone seatbelts, drunk driving, are all legislated for, so they, they've come up with ways of enforcing them. Um, and, and I think Sheila's point of it being part of the regular road traffic duties would be, would be a sensible yeah. one to take. But they, they do require resources, and they do require police resources. If you're given more responsibilities... They do require police resources, which is an infinite resource. They, 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 you know, they, do we... I mean, you could, for example, I suppose, decide that tobacco and alcohol would be dealt with together as issues at the same time. That would be one way of doing it. Dennis Robertson. Thank you, convener, and good afternoon. Uh, I'll try and be brief, convener. Uh, I should declare as well that I'm the uh, convener of the cross-party group in heart disease and stroke, uh, which uh, BHF are part of the secretariat. Um, I, I have no uh, qualms at all about the evidence regarding um, second-hand smoke. I just sometimes think, you know, because we talk about smoke, when the smoke's dissipated, there's no smoke, and we're really talking chemicals, and this is maybe part of the, the, the problem, getting that information across. I've heard, I think, from everyone on several occasions uh, in the short space of time we've been talking this morning about education, awareness. Do we require legislation? Is it about education and awareness? James. I would contend that we, I would contend that we do. Uh, the most recent census stats uh, interviewed 12 and sorry, excuse me, 13 and 15 year olds within Scotland, and that indicated that 22% of those young people in Scotland are often or regularly travelling in a car, and and uh, wh wh where smoking is taking place. Sheila's already indicated the fact that there's a certain powerlessness. I've felt that powerlessness myself as an adult who just needed a lift to work, but certainly when it comes to the context of a child or a young person, there's a powerlessness to intervene to protect themselves in that way. Mm -hmm. When I put that alongside the scale of the immediate and long-term medical threat that this causes to children and young people, then my conclusion is that, yes, there is no, an I, I, I'm, I'm no that. problems about the evidence and the medical effects that impacts. I mean, that, I think that's a given, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, and I'm taking up the convener's point about the enforcement to some extent. And what I'm saying is, is it still about education and awareness? We, we are accused sometimes in, 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 in governments and parliaments about taking forward legislation that isn't necessary. And, you know, where it should be a, a different uh, approach. And, and I'm just wondering, is it education and awareness? Do we need to have this absolute... Cap Do we need to be more smart? Uh, every, time we sit, every time a car is sold... Does it have a, with a handbook, does it have a no smoking sticker attached to it? You know, no smoking children in a car. You know, should there be a sensor built into the car so when someone lights up, it goes off? Just like you have seat belts. You know, if you're not wearing a seat belt, you get a, a sensor going off. You know, are there other things that we should be doing rather than taking forward legislation? I think generally um, you have to do a number of things and you have to do them repeatedly to be able to raise awareness and change practice. And I saw the public attitude to tobacco smoke revolutionise itself over the course of six years in the debate on smoke-free public places. Now, if, the, uh, if as, as a nation Scotland had unlimited resources, we might be able to do the sustained level of education and awareness raising that would be required to change culture. But um, my experience would be that there would be significant media interest in this legislation and that you will get free education and awareness raising that would cost a lot of money from the public funds in any other way. Yes, David. I mean, from a British Heart Foundation point of view, I mean, um, we, we've looked at international examples in Australia and Canada and, and where this has been brought in and legislated for and, and seen that it has a substantial impact on, you know, the, the, the reduction in children um, going in, uh, in car journeys. And I think James alluded to the 60,000 a, a day that, that is happening. And I think the scale of the problem, the health impact that we're talking about here, I think it really 
you know, begs the question of why haven't we done it already in Scotland? And, uh, you know, we, we have a history of being progressive on things like smoking in public places. And I think, um, I think the time has come that, that, you know, that Scotland really does need to act on this. It is, uh, we're not talking about five or six kids a day that are doing 60,000 journeys are happening. And, it's, and, and that's, you know, one's too many, really. But I think that, that number and scale is, is massive and it's something we really should be acting on. Richard, oh, yeah, sorry. oh sorry, Dennis. I was going to say I'm not against taking forward legislation. I, I'm just asking if it was necessary. Yeah. Uh, my, my other point, if I may, convene yes, before certainly. you bring in Richard, is it's on the uh, and it's maybe something that these witnesses may not have a particular view on. But it's it's about the the adult age limit, the 18. Uh, you, you can actually hold a license at 17. And uh, my other point is, if you've got a, a young person smoking in a car who is 16. Uh, and there's uh, no adult there. I mean, they're just sitting in a car and they're just smoking. You know, um, you know, the legislation doesn't seem to cover that. You know, it's just this adult age of 18. Um, that's a peculiar age limit for me. You have a view, Sheila. My understanding is that 18 is generally an accepted age for child protection internationally. Um, when you're talking about child rights, like to, to learn to drive or whatever, 16 is, is, tends to be preferred. Well, we have a different legislation in Scotland in terms of the age, in terms of children, transitions, uh, care, duty of care. Um, I'm just wondering if that needs to be looked at. Well, I think that's to do with supporting children and children's independence and rights. And this is, uh, the age of 18 is generally, I think, internationally accepted for protecting children. James, I think from the BLF point of view, we, we could see no clear, definitive, correct age uh, because of the complexity that, that, that you mentioned. I, and from an organisational point of view, we would, be, we would be quite relaxed in terms of, 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 of where this went and where the legislators thought would be the most sensible cut-off point. Yeah, yeah Sheila, you come back. I suppose in terms of um, underage sales and, and so forth, yeah. having a higher age range makes it easier to distinguish when children are younger. Um, there's less argument, you know, if, if the cut-off is 18 rather than 16. Mm. Yeah. 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 That, that, was, that was a point I was going to make, is, is actually 18 is the age that you're legally allowed to purchase cigarettes, so... Technically, we shouldn't really have 16-year-olds sitting smoking in a car, though in reality, we probably do. Mm. Richard yes, Simpson. I, I want to ask about a slightly different issue, and that is the level of accidents that occur in cars with uh, drivers who smoke, uh, because I understand that actually that is considerably higher than the cars which are non-smoking, but is that the case? Um, I mean, my understanding is that it is noted as a factor in, in road traffic accidents, and it's probably significantly underreported. It isn't always uh, you know, put down as, as the cause of the accident. I think that it may be covered under existing motoring uh, restrictions. Because I'm just wondering whether we should, you know, why, 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 as Mike McKenzie was saying right at the beginning, I mean, Slippery slope, but you know, a slope upwards in this case. Why don't we just ban smoking in cars completely? Because if the accidents are greater, uh, you know, I think anything you do with your hands, apart from actually having them on the steering wheel, uh, is not good. But I mean, and smoking is really unnecessary. So why don't we just ban smoking in cars completely rather than just the more reasonable thing of protecting children? I suppose this, this legislation for us is about protecting children and, and we would like to see this secured. Okay. And, we, and we are here examining a bill that didn't propose any of that. I know, I know. Uh, E-cigarettes in the car wouldn't be covered by this bill? That's not the proposal that's on the table and there isn't the same level of established evidence of harm that there is for tobacco smoke, which is really irrefuta irrefutable, although I wouldn't be surprised if you uh, didn't get challenges on that from some of the tobacco industry representatives. Right. OK. Is there any other questions? We don't need any, do we? Thank you very much for your attendance today. We look forward to uh, going on, on this journey with you over the next uh, few weeks and uh, seeing the further evidence. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, I think that um, uh, concludes our...
business for today. But, eh? But, but I didn't. Uh, we can close.